Hello my dear CA Inter Aspirants. Welcome to the second video of this past exam question series. And today we are discussing January 2021 exam question paper for paper 4A direct tax loss for your CA Inter. And in this question paper, while discussing this question paper, we will consider every working note, every other adjustment which are fully amended for your May 2022 or November 2022 examination. So without wasting time, let's get started. All right, friends. So moving on to question number one. So we'll start reading question number one. Mr. Krishna aged 65 years. So he's a senior citizen. All right. A furniture manufacturer reported a net profit of 5 crore 64 lakh 44,700 for the previous year 2122 after debiting or crediting following items. And what is the final requirement of this question, friends? So before reading this question, let's understand what exactly is the final requirement. They are uh, asking you to compute the total income and the tax payable by Mr. Krishna for assessment year 2223 by ignoring the provisions of 115 BAC. That means you don't have to consider the new slab rate which is mentioned under 115 BAC we need to come consider only the normal slab rates all right so friends let's start doing this question this question carries 14 marks and friends this is actually a part of your January 21 examination I have changed the dates and we will while solving this question we will consider all the amendments for May 22 or November 22 as well so let's start solving this question friends. So we will write the net profit as usual. We will start with the net profit. So PGBP profits or gains from business or profession. We'll start with the net profit as per PNL account. What is the net profit as per PNL account? It says 5 crore 64 lakh. So we'll write it here 5 crore 64 lakh 44,700 rupees is the net profit as per PNL account. All right, so we will write all the working notes here for simplicity. We will consider the working notes here. All right, in examination, you can put working note number and you can what write your working notes in a different page. It's it's absolutely fine. But here only for the convenience, I am considering all the working notes here itself. All right. So friends, listen, what are the adjustments in relation to this? So let's read all the adjustments in relation to this. There are certain debits that means the following items which are about to mention is already debited in the PNL account so let's consider the debits first all right friends so first item is rupees 20,000 paid to uh, Gurudwara registered under ATG of income tax act in cash where no checks are accepted so the first debit one of the debited items in the PNL account is actually a donation given to some Gurudwara which is registered under ATG but the donation is made in cash. So friends hope you remember under section ATG if donation amount is more than more than 2000 then you are not supposed to make it in cash. It is not allowed as a deduction if it is made in cash. If made in cash. That simply means cash donations under ATG over and above 2000 rupees is not allowed as a deduction under ATG. So here the donation amount is 20,000 rupees. So you are not supposed to consider that entire 20,000 rupees as a donation under ATG. If the cash donations is over and above 2000, then the entire donations is not eligible to be claimed as a deduction under ATG. That is the first thing that you should remember. Now the second thing is, it is already debited in the PNL account, right? So you have to add back this particular 20,000 from the net profit. Then you need to compute the uh, a real profit as per income tax act and you are not supposed to claim it as a deduction under ATG as well. So the adjustment here is adding back donation. Donation to Gurudwara that is 20,000 rupees we are adding back and it is not allowed as a deduction under ATG as well since it is a cash donation which is over and above 2,000. I hope it is clear for you. Now, moving on to the second adjustment, 48,000 contributed to a university approved and notified under section 35 subsection 1 close 2 to be used for scientific research. So, it is actually a contribution given to a university who does scientific research. So, those contributions are well allowed as a deduction under section 35. 
these contributions are allowed as a deduction under section 35 since it is already debited in the PNL account. Since the 48,000 rupees is already debited in the PNL account, no further adjustment is required. So, we will write a note for that. So, the note says contribution to scientific research university under section 35 is allowed as deduction. Is allowed as deduction since it is already debited in PNL, no further adjustment required. Adjustment required. You don't need to consider any other adjustment because it is already debited in the PNL account. I hope that too was clear for you. All right. Now, next one adjustment number three that is interest paid rupees 1,67,000 on loan taken for the purchase of electronic vehicle on 15 5 2021 from a bank and e vehicle was purchased for personal use of his wife first of all this e vehicle is purchased for the personal use of that assassin's wife all right assassin's name is mr krishna so it that interest on loan of a vehicle which is used for personal purpose is not allowed as a business expenditure that is the first thing that you should consider so you have to add back that entire 1,60,000 from the net profit to arrive at the correct business profit. That is the first adjustment required. Then adjustment number two, under 80 EEB, there's a section called 80 EEB of income tax. If an SSC has taken a loan between 1st April 2019 and 31st March 2023 for purchase of what? Electronic vehicle, then interest on loan up to 1,50,000 is allowed as a reduction under 80 EEB of Income Tax Act. So here, definitely SSC is actually taken a loan for the purchase of an electronic vehicle. So he is eligible to take claim that interest as a reduction under 80 EEB of Income Tax. So what we can do is first we need to add back interest on loan for purchase of purchase of electronic vehicle so what is the entire interest 167000 is the entire interest and under 80g so we will write here under 80eeb not 80g 80eeb up to 150000 rupees is allowed as a deduction so here 150000 rupees is allowed as deduction since the actual interest is 167, only up to 150,000 is allowed as a deduction under 80 EEB. All right. So that is the adjustment required for the second item. Now, so the third item. Moving on to the fourth item. His firm has purchased timber under forest lease of 20 lakh for the purpose of business. So the question says he purchased timber for the purpose of business. So it is just like a raw material, right? He purchased timber for the purpose of his business. That simply means it's a kind of raw material because he's a furniture manufacturer. He definitely require what timber. So it is a purchase of raw material. So no further adjustment required as per this particular question. Why? Because raw material is just like a timber and you're purchasing raw material for your manufacturing, your furniture. Definitely it is allowed as a normal purchase expenditure. So no further adjustment required for that. You need to write a note. So furniture is like his raw material, hence it is allowed as a deduction that you can write here. All right. Now, moving forward with the credit, there are certain credits. First item is income of 4 lakh from royalty on patent registered under patent act receipt from different resident clients and no TDS needed to be deducted by any of the clients. So he received 4 lakh in aggregate from different different clients and this was on this is based on some patent right this royalty is received based on some patent so first of all my question is this income is not taxable as a normal business income it will be taxable under ifos all right because he is a furniture manufacturer and he had some inventions we don't know what exactly is the invention all right and he receives some income some royalty income on account of this inventions then that income is not accessible under pgbp it will be taxable under ifos that is the first thing that you should know so what we can do we will deduct royalty on patent how much is the royalty he received friends as per this question it is four lakh rupees is the royalty he received so we have to deduct this four lakh rupees from here all right, we have to deduct this 
4 lakh rupees from here and you need to consider it as an income taxable under IFOS. So income from other source that the first item is royalty on patent is definitely a taxable income under IFOS the amount is 4 lakh. And now friends there is a section under chapter 6a that is under section 80 RRB if an assessee is in receipt of what royalty on patent then he is eligible to claim a deduction under 80 RRB and friends you tell me what is 80 RRB deduction either actual amount of royalty on patent received or 3 lakh rupees whichever is lower shall be the actual deduction under 80 RRB there are two deductions 80 QQB that is for royalty on book orders and 80 RRB is for royalty on patents so here it is 80 RRB now tell me what is the actual royalty received here actual royalty received here is 4 lakhs and the second limit is 3 lakhs whichever is lower is the final deduction so you can claim 3 lakhs as a deduction as of as per this adjustment all right so 3 lakh rupees will be the deduction here moving forward friends to the next credit the next credit it says he received 3 lakh from a debtor which was written off as bad in the year 2017-18 so it requires some what additional explanation so mr krishna mr krishna received what 3 lakhs he received 3 lakh rupees from one of his what one of his debtors right one of his debtor which was written off as bad in the year 2017-18 so this was claimed as bad this was claimed as bad in the year 2017-18 that's what they are saying all right super now the amount due from the debtor which was written off as bad was 5 lakh out of which tax officer had only allowed 3 lakh so the point is friends listen listen the actual amount claimed as bad was 5 lakh the 5 lakh was claimed as bad claimed as bad by the assessee in the year 2017-18 yes or no out of this only 3 lakh is allowed as deduction 3 lakh is allowed as deduction by the tax officer by the tax officer that's what the question states now listen um, as a deduction computing total income of assessment year 18 19 but he received 3 lakhs from the debtor right now so that is the point so friends listen what is this adjustment he in 17 18 he claimed 5 lakhs as bad all right assessing officer allowed only 3 lakhs as bad that means from the contention of assessing officer that means tax officer taxing officer what was his contention he said you will get back two lakhs according to his point he says that you will get two lakhs as what as recovery all right only three is bad but ultimately in the year 2021-22 he got three lakhs back from whom from that particular data all right so they were only expecting 2 lakhs to get back but they got 3 lakhs so what is the adjustment required friends the final adjustment required is 1 lakh have to be treated as income under section 41 as recovery of bad debt yes or no see friends listen listen I will read that adjustment again for a better understanding listen friends he received 3 lakh from debtor which was written off as bad in 17 18 the amount due from the debtor which was written off as bad was actually 5 lakh out of which the tax officer had only allowed 3 so he claimed 5 assing officer said you will get back 2 so he allowed only 3 as bad debt according to his contention, contention of assing officer he will get back 2 lakhs but he got 3 he got 3 lakhs back then what is the ultimate adjustment he claimed 3 lakh as bad debt stating that he will only get 2 lakh back but he got 3 lakh back so the extra 1 lakh should be what taxable income yes or no that extra 1 lakh he received in 2021-22 have to be treated as an income under section 41 like recovery of bad debts yes or no friends so that is the ultimate adjustment required but what happened here is he received 3 and he credited the entire 3 yes or no it is under credits that simply means he received 3 lakh and he might have credited that entire 3 lakh in the PNL account 
Now you tell me what is the final adjustment required. He need to credit only 1 lakh. Yes or no? He claimed 5. Assessing officer disallowed 2, stating that he will get back 2, but he got back 3. So that extra 1 lakh have to be treated as his income. But he credited entire 3 lakh in the PNL account. Now you tell me what is the final adjustment required? You need to add back 2 lakh. Yes or no? Why? He has, sorry, you need to deduct 2 lakh. I'm sorry, you need to deduct 2 lakh. Why? Because according to the uh, income tax provision, we need to consider only 1 lakh as income. Here he credited the entire 3 lakh as his income. So ultimately 2 lakh have to be reduced from the net profit to arrive at the correct taxable profits. Yes or no? So let's solve the adjustment. So deduct excess amount credited that is 2 lakh from the net profit. <clears throat> Alright, so that is the final adjustment for this particular question. Now, 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 moving on to the third adjustment, it says, what is the third adjustment, friends? It says, he sold some furniture to his brother for 7 lakh. So, it is actually sales. And the fair market value of the furniture was 9 lakh. So, furniture is basically his stock in trade. He sold it to his brother for a value which is less than the fair market value. So is there any issue? There is no problem at all. According to income tax law, if you are purchasing something from your relative, if you are purchasing something from your relative, your brother, sister, lineal ascendant, descendant, your spouse, children, etc. will be your relative, no doubt in that. But when you are purchasing something from your relative and you are making excess payment to relative, then that excess portion shall be disallowed under 40A2, there is a section called 40A2, excess payments to relatives. But here, as I see, is Mr. Krishna and he sold something to his brother. Alright, he sold something to his brother and the fair market value of the goods sold is 9, but he collected only 7. Alright, so this is the case of sales. The fair market value of sales was 9 and he collected only 7. Is there any problem? There is absolutely no problem. 40A2 won't be applicable here. Because 482 applies only in case of purchase amount which is excess compared to the market value. Here it is sales and the sales was comparatively less. So Mr. Krishna, there is no income tax impact. There is no further adjustment required. You can write a note for that. Section 482 is not applicable. Not applicable on sales. On sales. While selling something, 48 is absolutely not applicable. So you do need to consider that here. So no further adjustment required for that adjustment 3. Now there are some other information in the question. So friends, let's understand each and every other information in the question. So listen, adjustment number 1 or other information number 1. Depreciation in the books of accounts is computed by applying the rates prescribed under income tax laws. Super. So what they say is depreciation in the books of accounts is computed by applying the rates prescribed under income tax laws. Okay, fine. We are happy with that. Thank you. All right. Now, moving on to adjustment number two. Mr. Krishna purchased a new car which has a value of 12 lakh on 1st September 2021 and the same was put to use in the business on the same day. No depreciation for the same has been taken on car in the books of his accounts. So he purchased the car, the value was 12 lakh and he forgot to claim depreciation. So let's claim depreciation for Krishna. So depreciation on car. So Krishna being a, uh, what do you say, being a manufacturer of furniture, definitely he can claim depreciation on car if he have used that particular car for his business purpose. Yes or no? So let's compute depreciation for Mr. Krishna. So how much is the depreciation friends? So the question says 12 lakh is the purchase of car. And it has been purchased on 1st September and put to use on the same date. 1st September, if you start counting from 1st September to 31st March 2022, it will be more than 180 days. As or no, you start counting from 1st September onwards, including 1st September. It has been put to use from that date onwards. So it will be more than 180 days. As or no. So the rate of depreciation will be full 15%. He can claim full 15% as the rate of depreciation on this 12 lakh. So 12 lakh into 15 percentage it would be 12 lakh into 15 percentage the amount would be 1 lakh 80 thousand you can claim it as a deduction as depreciation all right now friends listen if you have purchased car in 2019 
2019 28 sorry 23rd august that means if you have purchased that car between 23rd august 2019 to 31st march 2020 between that period then you could have claimed the depreciation at 30 percentage because for a normal person if he purchase a car between 23rd august 2019 and 31st march 2020 he can get up to 30 percent adjust the depreciation all right but here in this question you don't need to consider that because in this question the car is purchased on 1st september 2021 all right so definitely the rate of tax would be what rate it would be at normal 15 percentage itself i hope that is super clear for you now friends moving on moving on with the next adjustment so we were discussing about the car all right now adjustment number three Adjustment number three in the additional information. Okay, it has not been debited or credited to the PNL account. Now, adjustment number three. Mr. Krishna sold a house on 30th March 2019. So, we will write a separate working note for that because it looks like a very hectic adjustment. Okay, <laughs> yeah. All right, so Mr. Krishna has sold a house on 30th March 2019. So, he sold some house on 30th March 2019. 2019 all right so there will be some capital gain impact on that so what happened is and deposited the long-term capital gain of 25 lakh in capital gains account scheme by the due date of filing return for that year and he deposited he deposited how much is the amount he deposited 25 lakhs he deposited 25 lakhs in capital gains account scheme in that year in that year itself that's what they are saying so hope you remember if you have if a person have transferred his residential house property and he is purchasing or constructing another residential house property in the case of purchase he can he can purchase that new residential house property before one year or two years after the date of transfer in the case of construction he can construct a new house property within three years from the date of transfer and if he is doing this activity then he can claim an exemption under 54 hope you remember i have a house i've transferred it and i've received some long-term capital gain i've incurred some long-term capital gain i can invest this long-term capital gain in another residential house property then i can claim exemption under 54 for that the time there is a time frame they states in case of in case of purchase of new residential house property you need to purchase it one year before or two years after the date of transfer date of transfer and in case of construction if you are constructing a new residential house property you need to construct it within three years from the date of transfer this is what the act says all right now let's see and if he is not purchasing or constructing the new house in the year of transfer of original house property then he need to invest that equivalent amount in the capital gains account scheme according to section 54 hope you remember you have we have covered 54 under capital gains chapter so if a person is not planning to invest that long-term capital gain in the year of original transfer of asset then he must he must what deposit that equivalent amount in a capital gains account scheme and he can utilize the amount from the capital gains account scheme within these dates for purchasing or constructing the new residential house property now now let's continue on 1st march 22 he sold another house property in which he resided he uh, resided for one crore so on what date on I will repeat the date again friends on 1st March 22 so on 1st March 2022 he sold another residential house property where he receives what he receives an income for 1 crore he sold it for 1 crore he sold it for 1 crore rupees that's what they are saying super and he earned a long-term capital gain of 50 lakh on sale of this property so he sold it for 1 crore and he earned a long-term capital gain that is 
50 lakh for the sales of this particular property in the year 22 or in the year 2021 22 all right no problem on 25th march 22 he withdrew the money out of his cap gain account and invested 1 crore on construction of one house so on which date friends let's read that date again on 25th march 2022 on 25th march 2022 he withdrew he withdrew this 25 lakhs this 25 lakhs he withdrew the amount that means that 25 lakhs from cgas capital gains account scheme and he invested and he invested how much he have invested he has invested around 1 crore rupees that means he withdrew 25 lakhs from the capital gains account scheme and he took 75 lakhs from his pocket and he invested total 1 crore in what in 1 crore in construction of one house for constructing a new house or we will write it here he invested 1 crore for constructing new house that's what they are saying super so friends what they have done so on 25th march 2022 he withdrew the money and uh, uh, out of his capital gain account and invested one crore in construction of one house so he invested one crore by 25th march 2022 yes or no now friends let's see let's check everything so this 25 lakhs has been withdrawn on which date on 25th march 2022 and he invested in construction of new house all right now friends listen this 25th march 2022 you have to check whether it is within this three years from the date of original transfer of asset the original transfer of old asset was 30th march 2019 and he invested 25 lakhs in capital gains account scheme and on 25th march 2022 he withdrawn everything and invested in the what invested in the new residential house property now let's check friends so 30th march 2019 means 2020 21 22 so that means before 30th march 2022 he have to invest this 25 lakhs on construction of a new residential house property that he's already invested he has invested on 25th march 2022 all right so he has invested 25th march 2022 no problem for that this 25 lakhs has been correctly invested correctly or timely invested we can say timely invested so there is no problem for that now along with this 25 lakhs he took 75 lakh again from his pocket all right so on 25th march 2022 he took 75 extra lakhs from his pocket and friends friends listen on 1st march 2022 he sold a residential house property and there was a capital gain long term capital gain of 50 lakh also all right so ultimately what happens on 20th march 2022 he sold another residential house property and he had a long term capital gain of 50 lakh And this 50 lakh is also invested in the new residential house property which is constructed on which date on 25th March 2022. So that is also invested in the uh, newly constructed residential house property which is constructed on 25th March 2022. So ultimately he can gain what exemption under 54 for this 50 lakh also. Yes or no? So what is the final adjustment required in this question friends? So, in the, as a final adjustment, we can write under capital gains, there is a transfer of residential house property on 20, 20th March 2022. It's on 20th March 2022 and the long term capital gain was 50 lakhs. 50 lakhs. Under section 54, he can claim that entire 50 lakhs as an exemption from the long term capital gain since he has invested that amount in constructing a new residential house property. Along with that you can write a note as well. What is the note? The amount invested, amount invested 
in capital gains account scheme on 19th march 2000 30th march sorry 30th march 2019 has been timely utilized timely utilized that is on or before 30th march 22 it has been timely in, utilized so no further adjustment required for that too and friends what happens if he hasn't invested that particular amount in the capital gains account scheme on time if he haven't invested that amount in the capital gains account scheme on time that unexpired or the balance amount of uh, or the balance amount which is in the capital gains account scheme will be deemed as a long term capital gain which is taxable in the end of third year i hope you got my point all right here it has been timely utilized so no further adjustment required for that too super now friends moving on to the fourth additional adjustment mr krishna also made following payments during the year 21 22 so he have made some following additional payments also lump sum premium of 30000 paid on 30th march 22 for the medical policy taken for self and spouse the policy shall be effective for 5 years that is from 30th march 2022 to 29th march 2027 and 8000 paid in cash for preventive health checkup of spouse as well so it is in relation to atd both the adjustments are in relation to atd so let's consider that too so under section atd so he have paid what he have mr krishna has paid a lump sum premium of 30000 so he have paid a lump sum premium of how much 30000 rupees which is for how many years it starts from 30th march 2022 as per this question it starts from 30th march 2022 to uh, 29th march 2027 so that simply means 30th march 2022 to 29th march 2027 it means how many financial years are covered friends how many financial years or we can say how many previous years are covered 30th march 2022 means 2021 22 is the first previous year covered yes or no 30th march 2022 is the first year covered that means it is in the year 2021-22 then 22 23 is covered then 23 24 is covered then 24 25 is covered 25 26 is covered 26 27 is also covered these are the financial years involved so how many financial years are there one two three four five six financial years are there you are not supposed to take it from 30th march to 29th march that means 22 starts from 22 23 24 25 26 27 it is not like that when you are paying premium medical insurance premium for multiple years what how to proportionate that amount as per income tax act as per atd what you have to do you need to count the number of financial years or previous years involved in that particular period so it starts from 30th march 2022 that means 30th march and 31st march is in the year 21 22 that have to be counted as one financial year then 20 to 23 second financial year 23 24 third financial year 24 25 fourth financial year 25 26 fifth financial year and 26 27 sixth financial year so what we have to do we have to take this 30000 premium and there is six financial years involved this is how you need to compute under atd we have covered it under atd hope you remember all right now what you have to do here is from 30th march 2022 to 29th march 27 there are six financial years involved so what is the proportionate premium that they can claim the proportionate premium would be 30000 divided by six financial year that simply means 30000 divided by six financial years it will be 5000 per financial year you have to claim 5000 as a deduction under atd now it's not yet over he have paid something more that is 8000 he have paid in cash for preventive health checkup of spouse and self 8000 preventive health checkup so as you know preventive health checkup maximum deduction allowable will be 5000 rupees not more than that 
he have paid it in cash that's not a problem preventive health checkup payment is in any method is acceptable but for health insurance premium you have to make the payment other than cash for actual medical expenditure also you have to make payment other than cash the here pre preventive health checkup definitely the method of payment is not that very relevant so he have paid around 8000 but he can claim a deduction up to rupees 5000 so the deduction shall be 5000 rupees for preventive health checkup he have paid 8 but he can claim only 5000 as hope you remember this under 80 d so i think that's it that's it now let's compute the net profit as per p and l account or the business profits as per pgbp let's compute it first so profits or gains from business or profession how much is the profits coming 5 crore 64 lakh 44700 564 44700 plus 20000 plus 167000 minus 4 lakh minus 2 lakh minus 1 lakh 80000 and the business profits would be let's compute the business profits friends and the business profits here would be 5 crore 58 51 700 5 crore 58 51 700 would be the business profits here so we will mark it up and how much from the capital gain nothing nil hope you know the reason all right now how much from ifos it is 4 lakhs so it is easy for us to compute the gross total income gti how much is the gross total income plus 4 lakh that would give you 5 crore uh, what is what is the gross total income 5 crore 62 lakh 51 700 right 5 crore 62 lakh 51 700 is the gross total income from that you can claim these chapter 6a deduction so how much will be the total income friends if you claim these chapter 6a reductions that is from 5 crore 62 lakh 51 700 you can deduct 1 lakh 50 thousand then 3 lakhs then uh, 5000 ATD again 5000 under ATD that will give you 5 crore 57 lakh 91 700 as the total income 5 crore 57 lakh 91700 will be the total income now friends i think that is the end of this uh, whether we have to check whether we need to compute the tax payable yes we need to compute the tax payable as well all right friends so let's compute the tax payable all right so let's compute the tax payable friends we know the total income is 5 crore 57 91 700 so we will note down the total income here total income would be 5 crore 57 lakh 91700 from this you need to compute the tax liability so the tax liability would be basic tax we are considering the old slab rate all right so up to 2 lakh 50 thousand rupees liability is nil then from 2.50 to 5 lakh the liability would be 2 lakh 50 thousand into 5 percent and that would give you 12,500 as the basic tax liability then from 5 lakh to 10 lakh it is 5 lakhs into 20 percent that would give you 1 lakh as the tax liability then about 10 lakhs how much is the above 10 lakh figure so about 10 lakh it would be 5 lakh 5 crore 47 lakh 91,700 into 30 percent so that would be into 30 percent 5 crore 47 lakh 91 700 into 30 percentage would be 1 crore 64 lakh 37,510 will be the total amount over there all right now by adding up 164 37 500 plus 1 lakh 12,500 and friends friends listen 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 there is actually a correction required in this because 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 listen in this question mr krishna is aged 65 years so he is a senior citizen all right you need to consider that too so the slab rate starts from 3 lakh rupees all right so the slab rate starts from up to 
3 lakh rupees your basic tax liability is nil. Then from 3 lakh to 5 lakh, 3 lakhs to 5 lakh, that 2 lakh rupees into 5 percentage will become 10,000 rupees will be the tax liability. All right. So let's compute it together. 1 crore 64 lakh 37 510 plus 1 lakh plus 10,000. And the total tax liability would be 1 crore 65 lakh 47 510. 1 crore 65 lakh 47 510 will be the total basic tax liability. Now there is this applicability of surcharge. Surcharge at the rate 37 percentage. Why surcharge become 37? Since the tax liability, our basic tax liability or total income is more than 5 crore or so that 37 percentage on the basic tax liability would be the surcharge. So 1 crore 65 lakh 47 510 into 37 percentage of the surcharge would be 61 lakh 22,579. We will take it as 79. All right. Now, by adding these two, by adding these two, our total basic tax liability plus surcharge would be 2 crore 26 lakhs, 70,089 rupees will be the amount. Now, on this, we can, we have to compute 4% says. So, 4% says it will be 9 lakh 6,000. 803 804 we can take 804 by adding that to our total tax liability would be 2 crore 35,007 sorry 2 crore 35 lakh 76,893 rupees will be the tax liability now friends listen this is the total tax liability total tax liability now, is, is it the net tax payable? This is the total tax liability. But if you ask me, sir, whether it is the net tax payable, the answer is no. This is not the net tax payable. Why? Because there are some elements of TDS and TCS. So let's consider the elements of TDS and TCS here. All right. So let's go back to the question and find out all the TDS and TCS elements. The first item here that you need to consider is what? The purchase of timber under forest lease so when an assessee purchases timber under forest lease under section 206 c subsection 1 assessee is supposed to make an additional amount of 2.5 percentage on the sales value to the seller as tcs so the tcs under section 206c subsection 1 on forest timber will be the amount of purchase of forest simple timber is 20 lakhs yes or no in the question it says it has been purchased for 20 lakhs so on that 20 lakhs into 2.5 percentage will be the tcs amount so 20 lakhs into 2.5 percentage is the tcs amount that will be 50,000 he have already paid as tcs that he can deduct it from the total tax liability to arrive at, to arrive at the net tax liability. Hope you got my point. Alright. So that TCS less than the TCS. So whatever is his total tax liability, he need not pay that 50,000 rupees because he have already paid it as TCS. Alright. Now, 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 what are the other TCS or TDS elements here? There was a purchase of motor car. Yes or no? There was a purchase of motor car for 12 lakhs. So when some assessee is purchasing a motor car for a value which is more than 10 lakhs, if you are purchasing a motor car for a value which is more than 10 lakh, you need to pay what TCS under 206C1F and the rate of TCS is 1%. So when the assessee purchases motor car under section 206C1F, motor car purchase. So basically friends, what is this TCS? The buyer makes an extra payment to the seller by calling it as what TCS. So when SSE Mr. Krishna purchases motor car, he need to pay an extra 1% on the sales value as what as TCS. So the TCS amount will be the sales value in the question. What was the sales value in the question? It was 12 lakh. Yes or no? So on this 12 lakh, he must pay an additional 1% as what as TCS and 12 lakh into 1 percentage it will be 
twelve thousand rupees. So he might have paid twelve thousand also as TCS that he can deduct it from the total tax liability. Then on royalty, the question itself is says on royalty he have received some royalty income. Hope you remember that. So under credits he have received a royalty of four lakh where no TDS was required to be deducted by any of their clients. So on that royalty there won't be any deduction of TDS. So you don't need to compute that. Now moving forward he have purchased he have not purchased he have sold what a house property for one crore. Yes or no he sold a house property that means immovable property he sold for one crore. So when the buyer under 194 IA, if the total value of consideration is over and above 50 lakhs while making the payment is supposed to deduct TDS at 1 percentage on 1 crore. Hope you remember that is under 194 IA TDS. So we can say under section 194 IA, the buyer, so he sold the residential house property. That means some buyer will be there. He need to make, hope you remember the adjustment. He sold some residential house property for how much value? For 1 crore rupees. Yes or no? So, the buyer is supposed to pay the seller, to pay the Mr. Krishna, what? 1 crore rupees. On that 1 crore, buyer is supposed to deduct TDS under 194 IA at 1 percentage. So, under 194 IA, the buyer on this 1 crore rupees will deduct TDS at 1 percentage. So, what is 1 percentage on 1 crore? It will be 1 lakh rupees. So that too you can deduct and there are no other TDS or TCA situations arriving in this question. So what is the final tax payable? We can say final tax payable after adjusting everything will be 2 crore 35 lakh 76,893 minus 50,000 minus 12,000 minus 1 lakh and it would be 2 crore 34 lakh. 2 crore 34 lakh 14,893. It can be rounded off to 890. All right. And this is the final tax liability as per this question. And this is your January 2021 examination question. And it carries how many marks? It carries 14 marks. I hope this question is super clear for you. All right, friends, now let's continue with question number two. So the, it says that examine the TDS and TCS implication in the following transactions and briefly explaining the provision involved assuming that you need to explain the provision. So you need to say whether TDS or TCS is applicable in the following situation and you need to explain the provision and you can assume that all the pays are residents. So in the following scenarios which we are about to discuss, all the pays are always residents. State the rate, you must state the rate and the amount to be deducted. So what are the requirements? You must tell whether TDS or TCS is applicable. That is the first thing that you should say. All right. And you need to briefly explain the provision. Briefly explain the provision. Then the rate of tax, rate of TDS and the amount of TDS to be deducted. These are the things that you should answer in the following scenario. All right. So let's start answering the scenario situation number one on 5 1 2001 mr b made three fixed deposits of nine months each of three lakh so mr b we will draw a flow chart for this so mr b has deposited nine months fd that is three lakh each all right, three, three lakh deposits he have made. That's what they are saying. So deposits of three lakh each. Total three deposits he have made. Carrying interest at nine percentage with Mumbai branch, Delhi branch and Chandigarh branch. So the first deposit is with Mumbai branch. Second deposit is with Delhi branch. Third deposit is with Chandigarh branch. Of which bank? CBZ Bank. So there is a bank called CBZ Bank. They have three branches and he made fixed deposit in all of these three branches. This bank follows a centralized banking solutions, CBS. That means complete centralized. They maintain their books, accounts, everything in a centralized manner. All right. So this is what they are saying. Now, what is the next thing? 
uh, the, these fixed deposits will get mature on 31st January 2022. So since it is a nine month deposit, it starts from 1st May 21 to 31st January 22 to get matured. So let's count May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December and January. Exactly nine months deposit it is. Now, which is the section involved here? The section will be 194A that is TDS on interest other than interest on securities. So this will be covered under 194IA that is TDS on interest other than interest on securities. Under 194IA, friends listen, if the aggregate annual interest, if the aggregate annual interest exceeds rupees 5000 then tds is required to be deducted at 10 percent that's what the act says if the aggregate annual interest exceeds 10,000, then tds is definitely required to be deducted at 10 percent now 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 listen in the case of fixed deposits in the case of fixed deposits if the pay is a resident if the pay is a resident then the threshold will be rupees 40,000. Threshold will be rupees 40,000 instead of 5,000. So the threshold will be 40,000 instead of 5,000. Now, if the pay is a resident senior citizen, then the threshold will be rupees 50,000 instead of 40,000. So in simple manner, in summarized manner, we can say under 194A, if this particular bank on its, its fixed deposit, if the interest aggregate interest payable by the bank to Mr. Uh, B if it is more than 40,000 because we don't know whether Mr. B is a senior citizen or not all right so we are assuming that he is not a senior citizen all right if it is exceeding 40,000 then definitely TDS is required to be deducted that's what we can say as a summary now let's check whether TDS is applicable here or not so the total interest is 3 lakh into 3 deposits into 3 deposits into 9 percentage is the rate of interest into 9 by 12. So let's check what exactly is the annual interest coming. So 3 lakh into 3 it will be total 9 lakh into 9 percent divided by 12 into 9 it would be 60,750 rupees is the aggregate interest payable by this bank. So 60,750 rupees is the aggregate interest payable by CBZ bank. Alright, so definitely this bank is required to deduct TDS at 10%. Alright, so even if even if Mr. B is a senior citizen, the threshold will be rupees 50,000. Here the aggregate interest is 60,750. So definitely we can say TDS is required to be deducted in this scenario. At what rate? At 10 percentage rate of tax. So what will be the rate of tax? 60,750 into 10% that will be 6,075 rupees will be the TDS 6075 rupees will be the TDS applicable here I hope it is clear so let's 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 fill the situation situation number one TDS is applicable the answer is yes all right barely explain the provision under section 194a at rate 10 percent and the amount 6075 rupees is the amount of TDS required to be deducted so that makes that situation one I think it is super clear for you. Now, moving on to situation number two. Let's read situation number two, friends. What is situation number two? Mr. Marwa, aged 80 years, so he is a super senior citizen as well as a resident, holds 6.5 percentage gold bonds 1977 of 2 lakh and he has 7 percentage gold bonds 1980 of 3 lakhs and he received yearly interest on these bonds that is 28th February 2000. 22 so we will write a flow chart or a uh, what do you say we will draw a flow chart for this as well so mr m we will call him as mr m he is of age 80 years all right and he has some investment in 6.5 percentage gold bonds gold bonds and what is the total amount of investment he has in that gold bond it is 2 lakh rupees and he has 7 percentage gold bonds as well 7% gold bond as well and what is the total amount of investment he has that is 3 lakh in that all right and he receives annual interest the question very clearly states that he receives annual 
interest on these bonds. So tell me friends, which is the section covered here? The section covered here is 193, that is interest on TDS on interest on securities. Under section 193 friends, please listen. Under section 193, a person who is responsible to pay interest on securities is supposed to deduct tax at 10%. The rate of TDS will be at 10 percentage and the time of deduction will be at the time of payment or credit whichever is earlier. But under section 193, there are certain exceptions uh, stated by the income tax. And one of the exceptions is if there is interest on 6.5 percentage gold bond. If there is interest on 6.5 percentage gold bond or 7 percentage gold bond or 7 percentage gold bond if interest is payable to an individual individual and that individual holds and that individual holds and the individual's holdings does not exceed that individual's holdings in this particular bond in aggregate does not exceed rupees 10,000 then TDS is not required to be deducted. So friends what it says very simple say I am an individual alright I am Mr. JK and I have 6.5 percentage gold bond or 7 percentage gold bond but my nominal value of the bonds which I have it is say less than 10,000 then TDS is not required to be deducted under 193 because it is covered under exception. If my holdings in these two bond aggregate exceeds 10,000, then definitely TDS is required to be deducted under section 193 of income tax at 10%. Now let's go back to the question. Here, what is the total holdings? The total holdings will be 5 lakh. Yes or no? The total holdings will be 5 lakh. So even though Mr. M is an individual, definitely on interest on these bonds, TDS is definitely required to be deducted. So friends, let's compute the uh, TDS rate here. So the first case it is 2 lakh into 6.5 percentage is the rate of interest. So 2 lakh into 6.5 percentage it would be 13,000 would be the interest in the first case here. And in the second case it is 7 percentage on 3 lakh. So 3 lakh into 7 percentage and it would be 3 lakh into 7 percentage and it would be 21,000 it will be the amount of TDS sorry amount of interest so what is the total amount of interest here so 21,000 plus 13,000 and that will be 34,000 is the total amount of interest from these two bonds on this 34,000 definitely TDS is required to be deducted at what rate at 10 percentage rate so the amount of TDS would be 3,400 rupees so the TDS amount would be 3,000 400 rupees in this particular scenario. I hope this too is clear for you. Now let's go back to our main sheet and let's fill the second scenario case. In second scenario, yes, TDS is required to be deducted under section 193. At what rate? At again 10 percentage rate and the amount of TDS required to be deducted in total would be 3400 rupees. I hope that is clear for you. Now, Moving on to the third scenario. What is the third scenario? Messrs. Uh, AG Private Limited took a loan of 50 lakh from Mr. Haridas. Alright. So, we will draw a flowchart for that too. So, Messrs. What is the company name? Messrs. AG Private Limited. AG Private Limited has took a loan from Mr. Haridas. So, they took a loan from Mr. Haridas and how much was the loan? They took a loan of 50 lakh from Mr. Haridas. So Haridas has advanced the loan of 50 lakhs to Messrs. AG Private Limited which is a company SSE. And now what is the interest rate for this? It credited interest of 79,000 payable to Mr. Haridas during the previous year 21-22. So they are now paying 79,000 as interest for their 21 22 that's what the question says so now it credited interest of 79,000 
79,000 payable to Mr. Haridas during the previous year 21-22. And Messrs. AG Private Limited took, uh, Messrs. AG Private Limited total turnover during the previous year 2021 does not exceed 1 crore. Alright, so now let's understand the year in which this interest is accrued is 21-22 and they are also saying in the previous year 2020-21 preceding previous year their total turnover of this AG private limited is less than 1 crore. That's also given in the question. Now which is the relevant TDS section covered under this friends? This will be under section 194A that is TDS on interest other than interest on securities. So under 194A interest is a TDS is required to be deducted at a normal interest which is exceeding 5000 rupees in aggregate in a financial year at 10 percentage. So if the amount of interest is over and above 5000 rupees then TDS is definitely required to be deducted at 10 percent and under 194A there is some restrictions if the deductor if the deductor is individual or a Hindu undivided family then they need to deductor means the person who pays the interest if it is an individual or a Hindu undivided family then TDS is required to be deducted only if that individuals or Hindu undivided families preceding financial years business total turnover exceeds 1 crore or professional gross receipts exceeds 50 lakhs. So if the interest is payable by an individual or a Hindu undivided family then TDS is required to be deducted only if the individuals business turnover in the preceding financial year exceeding 1 crore or his professional gross receipts exceeding 50 lakhs. So here the interest is payable by a company not by an individual. The pay is an individual. Alright. But the interest is payable by a company. So irrespective of the turnover limit, definitely if the amount of interest exceeds 5000, then TDS is required to be deducted at 10 percentage as per the provisions of 194A. I hope this point is clear for you. So we can say on the 79,000 definitely 10 percentage will be the TDS that is 7,900 rupees will be the amount of TDS that have to be deducted by the company and that is the final answer for this question. Now, now, now let's go back to the main sheet and fill the required columns. Point number situation number three. Yes, there also TDS is required to be deducted under which section again 194A. The rate of TDS same 10% and the amount of TDS deducted will be 7,900 rupees. Okay. Now there is one more scenario pending under this question. That is Mr. Prabhagar is due to receive 6 lakhs on 31st March 2022 towards maturity proceeds of life insurance policy taken on 1-4-2018 for which the sum assured is 5 lakhs and the annual premium is 40,000. So we will write a flowchart or we will draw a flowchart for this scenario as well friends. So what it says is Mr. Prabhagar right. So Mr. Prabhagar we will call him as Mr. P. So Mr. P has taken a life insurance policy on what date on 1-4-2018 he have taken a life insurance policy from LIC. Alright. Now. He is due to receive. Now he is about to receive 6 lakhs as maturity proceeds. Maturity proceeds, he is about to receive 6 lakhs from LIC. Alright. Now, the sum assured, the original sum assured was 5 lakhs. Now, students, you will ask me, sir, the sum assured was 5 lakh, and now why he is getting 6 lakhs? extra 1 lakh that may be due to bonus all right see at the time of taking policy there will be an assured sum then the percentage of profit again that can be called as a bonus also will be paid at the time of original maturity so the sum assured the original maturity amount which they receive will be comparatively higher than the sum assured normally all right now the sum assured will be 5 lakh rupees but the actual amount he got back is 6 lakhs 
Now, what is the annual premium he paid? The annual premium he was paying, annual premium paid by Mr. P to the LIC was 1,40,000. And the, they got this sum assured or they got this maturity proceeds on which date? On 31st March 2022. So, when there is what? There is maturity proceeds received from Life Insurance Corporation. The relevant tedious provision is under section 194DA. Alright. So, if TDS applicability is there, then it will be covered under 194DA of income tax. So, let us understand what exactly is the 194DA. So, friends, you tell me who is the deductor under 194DA? The deductor will be always Life Insurance Corporation. Alright. The, so, they need to deduct TDS at 5% at the time of payment when if the sum assured is more than or we can say if the maturity proceeds if the maturity proceeds is more than 1 lakh if the maturity proceeds is more than 1 lakh then they need to deduct TDS at 5% on the maturity proceeds under 194 DA now friends now friends one thing that you should know there is a deduction under section 1010 d of income tax there is an exemption not deduction there is an exemption under section 1010 d of income tax according to this exemption the act says that listen the act says that if the policy is taken on or after 1st april 2012 if the policy is taken on or after 1st april 2012 and the premium paid annual premium paid annual premium paid if it is less than or equal to 10 percentage of sum assured then full maturity proceeds will be exempted full maturity proceeds will be exempted all right now let's check in this scenario here the policy was taken on 1 4 2018 so it is after 1st april 2012 now what was the sum assured it was 5 lakh what was the annual premium it was 1 lakh 40 so let's check what is the percentage of annual premium which they are paying the sum assured was 5 lakh and the annual premium they have paid is 1 lakh 40 so let's check what exactly is the percentage of premium paid so 1 lakh 40 thousand divided by 5 lakh will be 28 percentage is the annual premium and here it says if the annual premium paid is less than or equal to 10 percentage of the sum assured then it will be fully exempted otherwise otherwise the full summary the, the amount will be fully taxable or we can say the amount will not be exempted under 1010d if the annual premium exceeds 10 percentage of the sum assured then exemption under 1010d is not at all applicable then definitely tds is required to be deducted yes or no now now from 2018 to 2022 is the premium period that means 18 19 19 20 20 21 and 21 22 it is for 1 2 3 4 4 years all right so the amount which he got back the total maturity proceeds total maturity proceeds he got back was 6 lakhs and the premium paid premium paid by this person was 1 lakh 40 thousand into 4 years yes or no he was paying premium for from 18, 19, 19, 20, 20, 21 and 21, 22. So he paid 4 years premium. So 1,40,000 into 4 years premium it will be 5,60,000 is the total premium paid by him. So you tell me what is the income he received at the time of maturity. What is the net income he receives? It is only 40,000. On this 40,000 TDS is required to be deducted at 5 percentage. On this 40,000 TDS is definitely required to be deducted at what percentage? At 5 percent. So, 40,000 into 5 percentage will become 2,000 rupees will be the amount of TDS that have to be deducted by the Life Insurance Corporation in this particular scenario. So, on this 40,000, 5 percent is the TDS which is required to be deducted and hence we can say, we can fill in our final column. So, as per that, 
Situation 4, yes, TDS is required to be deducted under section 194DA at what rate? At 5% rate and the amount of TDS which is required to be deducted was 2000 rupees. So that was 194DA scenario. I hope that too is clear for you. Now, if you write all the scenarios, how many marks you will get? You will get 8 super marks. I hope this question is super clear for you. All right, friends. Now let's move on to question number 3. So question number three, before starting question number three, let me tell you, uh, let me share a few information with you friends. So we have a new inter telegram channel for intermediate students, for CA as well as for CMA intermediate students. I have started a new telegram channel. This is the name of the channel. It is CAJK inter DT. All right. And the channel joining link is provided here. And you can do one more thing. You can straight away scan this particular QR code and enter into my channel. And this channel is exclusively for our CA, CMA, intermediate direct tax provisions, updates, amendments, past exam, question paper, the question paper, etc. A PDF of this question paper, I'll share it in the Telegram group as well. So you can join in this Telegram group if you wish to join. All right. Yes, friends. So without wasting time, let's continue our past exam question paper discussion. All right. So Mr. Xavier, an Indian resident individual set up a unit in special economic zone in the financial year 1718 for the production of mobile phones. And the unit fulfills all the conditions of section 10 AA of Income Tax Act 1961. Now, during the financial year 2021, he also he has also set up warehousing facility in the district of Tamil Nadu for storage of agricultural produce and it fulfills the conditions under 35 AD. So he has two businesses. One is at ZES. So tell me friends, what is the speciality of a unit in ZES? If you have started a unit in ZES, all right, then for the first 15 years, you can claim an exemption under 10 AA of income tax. What is the exemption? For the first five years, 100% of your export profit can be allowed as a exemption. For the second set of five years, 50% of your export profit is allowed as a exemption. And for the final set of five years, you can claim 50% of your export profit or actual amount transferred to ZES reinvestment reserve, whichever is lower is claimed as an exemption. All right. So for the first 15 years, you can claim what exemption if you have started a unit in a special economic zone. That's what 10 AA is all about. Now, 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 what is this 35 AD friends? 35 AD states that if you are a specified business which is mentioned under 35 AD of income tax, then you can claim the entire capital expenditure for your business as a reduction in the year of expenditure itself without capitalizing and without claiming depreciation. You can straight away claim those capital expenditures as a reduction under 35 AD. And under section 35 AD, capital expenditure excluding land financial instrument and goodwill excluding these three whatever expenditure you have you can claim it as a reduction under 35 AD and that's what the section states about so he has two businesses one mobile phone manufacturing which was in ZES and the other one is actually what it is for the storage of agricultural produce so storage of agricultural produce is definitely a specified business all right now let's continue reading the question the capital expenditure in respect of warehouse amounted to 93 lakh so there was some capital expenditure in relation to the warehouse and the warehouse become operational with effect from 1st april 2019 and the expenditure 93 lakh was capitalized in the books on that date all right further uh, details relevant for the financial year 21-22 are as follows there are certain further information in the year 21-22 also Profit from operations of warehousing facility before claiming deduction under 35 AD is given that is 1 crore 10 lakh rupees and net profit of ZES unit is given that is 50 lakhs and export sales of ZES is also given 90 lakhs. Domestic sales of ZES is also given 60 lakhs. You are supposed to compute income tax including alternate minimum tax under 115 JC payable by Mr. Xavier for the assessment year 22-23 and this question carries 6 marks so without wasting time let's start answering this question friends okay friends before me moving forward there is a small correction in the question you have to make that too this date this date listen the warehouse become operational with effect from 1st april 2019 this is not 2019 it should be 2021 
all right so here instead of 2019 we will make it 2021 all right so friends let's solve this question so as per this question mr savior has two units one in special economic zone so we will deal with the unit in special economic zone first all right so computation computation of total income for the year 2021-22 all right of mr xavier so let's compute the total income for the year 2021-22 so first we will consider the unit in zest so we will compute the profit of unit in special economic zone unit in zest so friends what are the informations in relation to unit in zest it is it says that the profit from operation of warehouse is given the profit from operation of warehousing facility is given net profit of zest is also given in the question that is 50 lakh net profit of zest unit is given in the question that is 50 lakh that's what they are saying so we'll start with the net profit of mobile unit unit in zest that is mobile unit mobile unit for that net profit is given in the question so net profit is 50 lakh rupees that is the total profit of unit in zest so as i've told you if you are a unit in zest then what is your advantage you can claim for the first five years how much is your export profit 100 percentage of that export profit is allowed as a deduction under 10 double a now the question what is this export profit how do we compute export profit for computing export profit you take the total profit you consider the total profit then divide it by the total turnover then multiply it by the export Port turnover this is what income tax act, act states so if your net profit is given in the question you take that net profit then you divide it by the total turnover then you multiply it with the export turnover to arrive at the export profit that export profit for the first five years will be fully exempted under 10 AA. that's what the act says now listen is there a domestic sales and export sales is given so export sales is 90 lakh and domestic sale is 60 lakh. So what is the total sale? It is 90 plus 60 will be the total sale. Yes or no? So let's check in which year we have. They have started operation in Zess in 2017-18. They have started their operations in Zess in 2017-18. So let's check it out. So 17-18 they have started their operations. 18, 19, second year, 19, 20, third year, 20, 21, fourth year, and 21, 22 is the relevant previous year, that is the fifth year. So this is the fifth year. So he can claim 100% of the export profit as a deduction here. So we will compute exemption under section 10 double A will be computed as per this working note number one. We will write a working note for that. All right. So the working note number one, we will write the working note over here. So we will take the total uh, total turnover we have to find out. How to find out the total turnover? In the question, export turnover is 90 lakh and domestic sales of Zess is 60 lakh. So export sales plus domestic sales will be the total sales. So export sales in this question is 90 lakhs and domestic sales domestic sales in this question is 60 lakh so the total would be 1 crore 50 lakh 1 crore 50 lakh will be the total turnover so we'll find out the exemption that is 50 lakh is the net profit divided by 1 crore 50 lakh is the total turnover multiplied by the export sales of 90 lakh will give you the exemption under 10 double a that will be 50 lakh divided by 1 lakh 50,000 multiplied by 90 lakh it would be 30 lakh will be the exemption under 10 double a yes or no this will be the proportion of export profit since it is a first year or sorry since it is within the first five years of operation they can claim that entire 30 lakh as a deduction so 100 percentage of export profit of 30 lakh is the exemption 
so the exemption will be 30 lakh exemption under 10 AA would be 30 lakh and the taxable net profit net profit taxable would be 20 lakhs it is as simple as that now that is the first scenario friends and now let's compute the second scenario what is the second scenario so second scenario is about not second scenario it is a second business unit it is in relation to warehouse warehouse amounted to 93 lakhs that's what we are about to discuss right now all right so capital expenditure in respect of warehouse amounted to 93 lakh so all right now friends let's compute the profit from operation of warehousing facility before claiming deduction under 3580 is also given in the question that is 1 crore 10 lakh now profit of so we have first computed the unit in says now business or we will compute specified business specified business that is warehousing of agricultural produce All right. Now, friends, you will ask me one doubt. Sir, under 35 AD, there is a clause like if one SSE have claimed exemption under 10 AA or uh, exemption under 10 AA, then the same SSE cannot claim 35 AD deduction as well. Likewise, if you are opting for 35 AD, then you cannot claim 10 AA. So here you will ask me, sir, sir, Mr. Uh, who is the SSE here? Mr. Savior, can he claim the benefit of 10 AA as well as 35 AD together? The answer is yes. Reason is, from a single business, an SSE cannot claim the benefit of 35 AD if he has opted for 10 AA or vice versa. Say for example, I have a business called, uh, say mobile phone unit. Say I have a business, it's a mobile phone unit, all right? From the same business, I cannot claim 10 AA as well as 35 AD. So here in this question, this unit in ZES is actually mobile phone unit and specified business is what? warehousing of agricultural produce so definitely SSE can claim both 35 AD others as well as 10 AA because 35 AD is from one business and 10 AA is from another business so here that is quite possible all right now let's compute the specified business profit so what is the profit from specified business it is given in the question profit from specified business is 1 crore 10 lakh rupees that is the profit from specified business now he is eligible to take a deduction under 35 AD because the question says this profit is before taking deduction under 35 AD, yes or no? So this profit is before claiming deduction under 35 AD. So he can claim deduction under 35 AD. Now let's compute his deduction under 35 AD. So the capital expenditure in respect of warehouse amounted to total 93 lakhs. So his total capital expenditure, total cap expenditure was 93 lakhs that is given in the question but it says including cost of land 13 lakhs this 93 lakh is including cost of land 13 lakhs so cost of land involved in this is 13 lakhs hope you remember under 35 AD except cost of land financial instrument and goodwill as he can claim 100% deduction under 35 AD for all other costs all right so 93 lakh minus 13 lakh it would be 80 lakhs would be the eligible deduction under 35 ad before concluding let me tell you one more thing this cost was incurred in which year this cost was incurred during the financial year 2021 he has started his operations all right but 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 listen 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 during the financial year 2021 he also set up he started setting up warehousing facility in tamil nadu for the storage of agricultural produce and capital expenditure of 93 lakh is incurred and the warehouse become operational so effectively they started the warehousing facility from 1st april 2021 that's the change i have told you to make from 2019 we have changed it to 2021 all right so this warehouse was operational with fact from 1st april 2021 and the expenditure of 93 lakh was capitalized in the books of accounts on that date so hope you remember under 35 ad if you have incurred some capital expenditure before commencement of business before commencement of specified business then what should be the treatment very simple 
on the date of commencement you capitalize all your prior period capital expenditure then you claim deduction under 35 ad except for land goodwill and financial instrument hope you remember so here the SSE has capitalized everything on 1st April 2021 and definitely he can claim deduction under 35 AD. Alright, now what is the net profit from this business friends? 1 crore 10 lakh minus 80 lakh which would be 30 lakh would be the profit from this particular unit. So the profit would be 30 lakhs. So now you tell me what is the total income of this SSE? He has a net profit of mobile phone unit is 20 lakh. And yes, net profit from agriculture warehousing is 30 lakh. So the total income, total income of this particular SSE will be 50 lakhs. That is 30 plus 20, 50 lakhs. Now, what is his age, friends? His age is not given in the question. It only says Mr. Xavier is an Indian resident. So he is a person with a normal age. All right. Now let's compute his tax liability. So computation of, we will compute his tax liability. So, computation of tax payable for Mr. Saviour for 21-22 as per normal provision. So, this is as per normal provision. Now, you will ask me, sir, why we are not considering 115 BAC? In this question, you don't have to consider 115 BAC. Why? Because the question is actually silent. But the point is, he is eligible to claim an exemption under 10 AA. The amount is 30 lakh. And he is also eligible to claim a deduction under 35 AD. And the amount is 80 lakh. If he is opting for 115 BAC, that is the new slab rates, then he have to give up both of these exemptions. Both 30 lakhs and 80 lakhs is gone. So his profit will be somewhere around very high amount, right? 1 crore 10 lakh plus 50, his profit will be around 1.60 crores. So definitely that won't be beneficial for him because under 115 BAC, if you are opting for 115 BAC, then you cannot claim the 10 AA exemption as well as 35 AD deduction. So in this question, I'm not even considering 115 BAC. The question is actually silent whether to opt for 115 BAC or not is not given in the question, but it is obvious. No SSE will be dare to often or dare to open or sorry opt for this new 115 BAC all right so if you want you can compute it and you can say 115 BAC is not beneficial here it is obvious so I'm not computing the effect of 115 BAC here now let me apply the computation of tax payable as per the normal provision so the total income in this question is 50 lakhs so what is the basic tax liability friends basic tax liability would be up to 250000 you don't need to pay any taxes all right so up to 2.50 lakhs it is nil then from 2.50 lakhs to 5 lakhs at 5 percentage it will be 12500 then from 5 lakhs to 10 lakh at 20 percentage the rate would be 1 lakh then about 10 lakhs the rate would be 30 percentage and that would be 40 lakh into 30 percentage it will be 12 lakh rupees also will come so the total basic tax liability would be what is the total basic tax liability it would be 12 lakh plus 1 lakh 12,500 it will be 13 lakh 12,500 will be the total basic tax liability 13 lakh 12,500 will be the total basic tax liability and there will be cess at 4%. There is no surcharge. If the total income exceeds 50 lakh only, surcharge is required to be paid. Here, the total income is what? Less than um, 50 lakh rupees. Less than or equal to 50 lakh rupees and surcharge is not required to be deducted. I mean, paid here. All right. So, cess 4% will become 52,500. 52,500 is the cess amount. So, the tax liability as per normal provision normal provision would be what is the tax liability as per normal provision it be 13 lakh 65000 would be the tax liability as per normal provision 13 lakh 65000 rupees now friends it's not over in the question itself they are saying one more thing while computing compute income tax including amt alternate minimum tax now friends what do you mean by alternate minimum tax so alternate minimum tax simply means if you are an SSE other than a company SSE, 
and you have claimed either 10 double exemption or 35 AD deduction or chapter 6A C heading deductions. For your inter, there is only three C heading deductions: 80 UQB, 80 RRB, and 80 JJAA. 80 JJAA is 30 percentage of employee cost for creating new employment opportunities. 80 JJAA. 80 QQB is for royalty deduction on royalty. 80 RRB is deduction on royalty on patent. All right. So if an SSC not being a company has claimed 10 double exemption or 35 AD specified business deduction or chapter 6 AC heading deduction, then he is supposed to pay the tax on 18.5 percentage of his adjusted total income as well. That simply means his final tax liability would be either the tax liability as per the normal portions of the act or 18.5 percentage of what 18.5 percentage of his adjusted total income this is what 115 jc alternate minimum tax is all about now you need to know what exactly is this adjusted total income so let's find out what exactly is the adjusted total income so computation computation of adjusted total income of Mr. Savior, Mr. X for the financial year 2021-22. So how to compute adjusted total income? First you take your normal total income. You have to take normal total income. So what is the normal total income in this question friends? The normal total income in this question we know it is 50 lakhs. Yes or no? So we can take the 50 lakhs normal total income first. Then for computing adjusted total income, first you need to add back exemption under 10 AA. The assessee, if he has claimed exemption under 10 AA, then you need to add back it your normal total income to arrive at the adjusted total income. Now what is the exemption he has claimed under 10 AA? 10 AA exemption was 30 lakh rupees. So we need to add back the 30 lakh rupees to the normal total income to arrive at the adjusted total income. So we are adding back 30 lakh to the normal total income. Now we have to add back 35 AD deduction after deducting notional depreciation. Hope you remember the provisions under 115 JC. Now, first of all, what is this 35 AD deduction which you have claimed from this question? The 35 AD deduction which we have claimed is 80 lakh. Yes or no? So first, let's add back that 80 lakh. But the point is while adding back that 80 lakh, you can claim notional depreciation notional depreciation so this 80 lakh is in relation to what building yes or no the question is very much clear that this 80 lakh is in relation to warehousing facility their capital expenditure would be what capital expenditure in nature of warehouse that means it is a building all right it was 93 lakh out of this 93 13 was on account of what 13 was on account of land that means this 80 lakh is in relation to building all right now friends listen what is this notional depreciation say listen you have claimed 35 AD deduction that's what 80 lakh is all about all right if the income tax department has denied this 80 lakhs if this income tax department say they are denying 35 AD deduction then what is the alternate option with the assessee assessee would have capitalized that 80 lakh in their books of accounts and they would have claimed depreciation under section 32 at 10 percentage rate on building yes or no Yes or no? Here while computing the adjusted total income, B, the income tax department in a way they are denying the 35 AD liability. So the, sorry, 35 AD deduction. So we are adding back 35 AD deduction of 80 lakhs. But at the time of adding back that 80 lakh, SSC can claim a notional depreciation at 10 percentage. That's what 115 JC states about. Hope you remember. Those who have followed my lectures, the, there is a chapter called miscellaneous provisions. Under this, we are discussing this particular point. So, notional depreciation would be 80 lakh into 10 percentage will be the notional depreciation. That is 8 lakh rupees is the notional depreciation. So, after deducting this, what will be the amount to be added back? It is 72 lakh will be the amount to add it back for computing the adjusted total income. Now, so after deducting these two or adding these two, what will be the adjusted total income friends? adjusted total income now let's compute the adjusted total income so 50 lakh plus 30 lakh plus 
72 lakh it would be 1 crore 52 lakh will be the adjusted total income 1 crore 52 lakh will be the adjusted total income now what is this alternate minimum tax your alternate minimum tax will be at 18.5 percentage on this 1 crore 52 lakh rupees so 18.5 percentage on this 1 crore 52 lakh will be 28 lakh 12,000 will be the basic tax liability all right on that there will be surcharge applicability all right so surcharge surcharge at what is the rate here the total income is 1 crore 52 so the total income adjusted total income is above 1 crore so the surcharge will be at 15 percentage will come hope you remember the surcharge rates for individuals if the total income is more than 50 lakh the rate of surcharge 10 percent more than 1 crore rate of surcharge 15 percent more than 2 crore rate of surcharge 25 percent more than 5 crore rate of surcharge 37 percent so here 15 percentage will be the rate of surcharge and 28 lakh 12,000 into 15 percentage it would be 4 lakh 21 4 lakh 21,800 would be the surcharge so adding these two basic tax plus surcharge would be 32 lakh 33,800 on that there is a cess at the rate 4 percent health and education cess so 4 percentage it would be 1 lakh 29,000 352 rupees will come so adding everything together your amt tax liability would be 33 lakh 63152 rupees will be your alternate minimum tax liability so friends now let's decide what is the final tax liability of this SSC. according to the normal tax provision he is supposed to pay only 13 lakh 65000 but according to alternate minimum tax provision he is supposed to pay 33 lakh 63152 so the final tax liability would be final tax liability would be either tax payable as per normal provision tax payable as per normal provision or tax payable as per alternate minimum tax whichever is higher this is the final tax liability according to alternate minimum tax provision so here the final tax liability would be final tax liability in this question would be 33,63,152 33,63,152 rupees that will be the final tax liability in this question and since the SSC was supposed to pay only 13,65,000 as the tax provision as per the normal provisions but according to this ultra minimum tax he is supposed to suffer an extra 33,63,152 so the difference he can claim as AMT credit. So alternate minimum tax credit. How much is the AMT credit? 33,63,152 minus 13 lakh. What was his normal provision? 13,65. 13 lakh 65,000 versus normal tax payable. So this difference amount. That means the additional amount he is supposed to pay due to this alternate minimum tax law was 19 lakh. 98,152 rupees this he can claim as a AMT credit so this is the final answer to the question I hope this is super clear for you and this carries around six marks all right friends now let's solve question number four so let's read Q4 Rajesh was employed in Axis Limited Mumbai all right he received a salary of 45,000 per month from 1st April 2022 20th September 2021 and he resigned and left for Dubai for the first time on 28th September 2021 and got monthly salary of rupee equivalent of 90,000 from 1st October 2021 to 31st March 2022. His salary for October to December was credited in Mumbai bank account directly and salary for January to March was credited in Dubai bank account. The cost of his air tickets to Dubai costing 1,50,000 was refunded by, her sis by his sister, her sister staying in London. And the cost of initial stay during Dubai was, refund was funded by one of his friends staying in Delhi. He further received 10,500 on his fixed deposits and 7,500 on his savings account with his Mumbai bank. He also paid one life insurance premium of 15,000 for self, for spouse 
and 25,000 for dependent mother aged 71 years. Compute the taxable income of Mr. Rajesh for assessment year 22-23. It carries 7 marks. Alright. So, this question is to compute the taxable income of Mr. Rajesh. So, we will write a heading. So, computation of computation of taxable income of Mr. Rajesh for the previous year 2021-22. All right friends, now before start solving this question, there are some information he received some salary from India and he received some salary from Dubai also. So we need to get his residential status for computing his taxable total income in India. So based on his residential status his taxable income also will change. Hope you remember under chapter 2 that is residential status and scope of income chapter we have learned if a person is a resident and ordinary resident his global income will be taxable in India. Hope you remember. Alright global income means those incomes which are Received in India, received outside in India, accrued in India, accrued outside in India, everything will be taxable in India. And if that person is a non-resident, then the income will be taxable in India only if there is that income is accrued in India. Or that income is first received in India. Hope you remember, that is said to be source rule for a non-resident all right that income have to be either accrued in India or first received in India for taxing those income of a non-resident in India hope you remember that so we need to understand what exactly is the residential status of Mr. Rajesh for the year 21-22 then only we can find out his taxable total income in India all right now so Mr. Rajesh was employed in Axis Limited Mumbai he received a salary of 45,000 from 1st April 2020 to 20th September 2021 he resigned and left for Dubai for the first time on 28 September 2021. So he resigned and he is on his journey to Dubai. On which date? The question is very clear. On 28 September 2021, he left India. Alright, this is the date of departure. So that is the date of departure. In the year 21-22, he left India. Uh, in the on 28th September 2021 all right and he went for Dubai and he got a uh, what job in Dubai all right so for determining residence status of individual there are two possibilities either his days of stay in India should be 182 days or more in the relevant previous year if a person's days of stay in India is 182 days or more in a relevant previous year that moment we can say he is a resident in India or is there is another possibility if a person is staying in India for 60 days or more in the relevant previous year and 365 days or more in four preceding financial years in that case also that person can be called as what a resident so 60 plus 365 condition we will call all right. If a person's relevant previous year days of stay in India is 60 days or more and he stays for 365 days or more in four preceding previous years, in that case also that person can be called as what? A resident. All right. And in income tax, this particular, sub, this particular condition is not applicable for an Indian citizen, Indian citizen who leaves India, who leaves India for employment purpose. Who leaves India for employment purpose this particular condition is not applicable so if you are a person and you are leaving India for employment purpose then the 60 plus 365 days condition is not applicable for you for these persons the one and only one condition for determining residential status is 182 days or more stay in India all right so let's now come back to this question this question is about mr rajesh who was employed in access limited he resigned his job and went out of india that means he went to dubai on 28th september 2021 so in the case of mr rajesh we need not check the 60 plus 365 days condition why because rajesh is definitely an indian citizen he left india for the first time to dubai that means he is a pure indian citizen and he left India for the purpose of what? An employment in Dubai. 
All right. So his 60 plus 365 days condition is not applicable in the case of Mr. Rajesh. That is the first thing that you should know. Then the only remaining condition for determining the residential status of Mr. Rajesh will be staying in India for 182 days or more. Now let's check whether he has stayed in India for 182 days or more. So he was in India in the year 2021-22. April, full April he was in India. That means for 30 days he will be in India. Now for May, full 31 days he is in India. For June, full 30 days he is in India. For July, 31 days he is in India. For August, 31 days he is in India. For September, how many days he was in India? 28 is the date of departure. So, hope you remember, while counting the number of days of stay in India, both the date of arrival and date of departure have to be counted as in, in India. Alright? So, after taking total of these all, 30 plus 31 plus 30 plus 31 plus 31 plus 28, it would be 181 days is his days of stay in India. I hope this is clear. If his stay is 181 days, that means 182 or more condition is not satisfying and hence his status would be what? Non-resident in India. His status would be non-resident in the year 21-22. I hope this much is clear for you. So, computation of taxable income of Mr. Rajesh. So, I will repeat that again, friends. So, he is an Indian citizen and he is leave, left India for the purpose of his employment. Hence, 60 plus 365 days condition is not applicable in his case. So, the only way for determining residential status in the case of Mr. Rajesh would be staying in India for 182 days or more. Since his days of stay in India is only 181 days, we can call him as a non-resident in the year 21-22. And now we are going to solve this question based on this information. So Rajesh is basically a non-resident in India as per our working note. Working note number one, we will write. Okay, super. So based on this information, we are about to solve this question. Okay, so listen. Now, anyways, he for the first time, that means on 28th September 2021, he left India. All right. So till 28th September 2021, he sorry, till 20th September 2021, he was in receipt of what salary. So the question says, he received a salary of 45,000 from 1st April 2022. 20th March 2000, sorry, 20th September 2021. So, till 20th September 2021, he was in receipt of salary from a Mumbai-based company called Access Limited. So, that is definitely accessible in India. Why? Because, I hope you remember, for a non-resident, his income will be taxable in India based on two conditions. Either it should be accrued in India or it should be first received in India. You are receiving some, you are providing some service in Mumbai. That means you accrued your salary for your services rendered in Mumbai. That salary will be definitely taxable in India. Yes or no? So we can write salary from Axis Limited. Axis Limited Mumbai. Taxable in India. Taxable in India. Now, friends, how much is the salary? We need to compute the salary. 45,000 per month is the salary. So for April, May, June, July, August, five completed months or five complete months he have worked. All right. So from April to August, there is no confusion. 45,000 per month into April, May, June, July, August into five months. Plus for September, he worked only for 20 days because on 20th September 2021, he left that particular job. Yes or no? On 20th September 2021, he left that particular job. So what we can do? September only 20 days salary he will get. 20 days salary means 45,000 divided by September you have 30 days into 20 days salary he will get. So the salary in total would be 45,000 into 5 that will be 2,25,000. 225,000 plus this third 20 day salary that is 45,000 divided by 30 into 20 that would be 30,000. All right, so the total salary which he received from this particular company would be 30 plus 225 that would be 
two lakh fifty five thousand is the total salary from this particular company that he receives. Two lakh fifty five thousand. I hope that is clear for you. Now, 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 it's not yet over. So the salary is completely over, and he got a monthly salary of rupee equivalent of ninety thousand from first October to thirty first March two thousand twenty two from Dubai. So he left India on twenty eighth September and he joined the Dubai based company. And from first October two thousand twenty one to thirty first March two thousand twenty two, he was receiving some salary from this Dubai based company. That is the next thing that they are saying. Now his salary for October two thousand October to December. His salary for October to December was credited in a Mumbai based bank. So his October to December salary was directly credited to a Mumbai based bank. That's what they are saying. So we can say. salary from october to december was directly credited to directly credited to mumbai based bank so we can say it is first received in india first received in india Yes or no? That amount is definitely first received in India. So what will happen? That equivalent amount. That means he is getting a monthly salary of ninety thousand rupee equivalent, right? So ninety thousand for three months will be first received in India. That means ninety thousand into three months would be two lakh seventy thousand is directly received in India again. So two lakh seventy thousand is directly received in India. All right? Yes. so that is also taxable salary in india super now now what now uh, then from salary for january to march 22 was credited in dubai bank account so from salary of this salary from this january to march was directly credited in dubai account that's what they are saying so those salary which is directly credited in his dubai bank account india does not have any taxing right because he is a resident non resident in the year 21 22 for taxing a non resident's income in india either that income should be accrued in india or it should be first received in india otherwise we cannot tax a non resident's income in india so here definitely uh, that uh, january to march salary is not required to be taxed in india or india cannot tax on that salary all right so the salary portion i think is over now from taxable salary in india definitely assc can claim what standard deduction and how much is the standard deduction 50000 this is the standard deduction and what will be the net taxable salary so 2 lakh 55000 plus 2 lakh 70000 into sorry minus 50000 it will be 4 lakh 75000 will be the net taxable salary 4 lakh 75000 rupees will be the net salary taxable in india so the question is not yet over there are a few more adjustment the cost of air tickets to dubai costing 1 lakh 50000 was funded by her sister staying in london so sister paid cost of air ticket to dubai so it is just like a gift from his sister his or her it was rajesh right so gift from his sister all right now friends listen if there he received a gift from his sister and the amount of gift was 1 lakh 50000 because it is funded by sister means sister has transferred the amount to mr rajesh for paying his what for paying his flight tickets all right so it is actually gift received from sister so it will be assessable under 56 subsection 2 clause 10 56 subsection 2 clause 10 states that if you have received any gift from relatives definitely your sister is your relative and you received some gift from your relatives it is not taxable under 56 subsection 2 clause 10 so assessee need not pay any taxes for that 1 lakh 50000 but you are supposed to write notes for that so under ifos gift received from sister not taxable under section 56 sorry under section 56 subsection 2 clause 10 since sister is a relative of mr rajesh and hence there is no impact on that 
Now, the question is not yet over. The cost of initial stay was funded by one of his friends staying in Delhi. So, his friend in Delhi has transferred what? His friend in Delhi has transferred uh, something to... Ah, again friends, one more thing you have to check. Cost of air ticket that 1,50,000 was funded by sister staying in London. So, sister who is a non-resident has given a gift to whom? His brother who is also a non-resident in India. That anyways will not be covered under 56 subsection 2 close 10 because the gift is actually given by a non-resident and it is received by some other non-resident. So, India cannot tax that particular gift. But in the second case, the cost of initial stay was given by his friend. Alright, the cost of initial stay was given by his friend who is in Delhi. So, a resident is now gifting something to a non-resident. So, under section 9, hope you remember, if a resident gives out any gift to a non-resident, then the gift shall be deemed to be accrued or arised in India according to section 9. And it will be taxable under section 56 subsection 2 clause 10. Hope you remember. We have covered, this is the combined reading of chapter 2 as well as IFOS chapter. Chapter 2, that is the residential status and scope of total income chapter. Under that section 9 states, if a non-resident is giving out any gift to a resident, sorry, if a resident is giving out any gift to a non-resident and the value of gift exceeding 50,000, then it shall be an income deemed to be accrued or arise in India. So here, what is the value of gift friends? Here the value of gift was only 40,000. So it is not deemed to be accrued or arise in India and hence we can say, this gift, this gift given by friend is not accessible, not accessible under section 56 subsection 2 close 10 since aggregate value, aggregate value of gift is less than 50,000. So that is also not accessible under 56 subsection 2 close 10. So you have to write notes for this otherwise you will lose marks in your exam. Super. Now friends going forward he further received interest of 10,500 on his fixed deposits. So fixed deposits and 7,500 on his savings account with Mumbai bank. So he has some FD in Mumbai bank. On that FD, he received 10,500 as interest on FD and 7,500 as savings interest as well. Both are taxable in India because the basically the deposit is in India. So it is accrued in India. So definitely both the interest incomes are taxable in India. So we'll write interest on savings account. First, we will write interest on fixed deposit. How much is the interest on fixed deposit? So in that question, the interest on fixed deposit is 10,500. Definitely accessible in India. And there is interest on savings bank account as well and what is the savings bank interest 7500 and friends under section 80 tta under section 80 tta interest on savings bank uh, up to 10000 rupees is allowable as a deduction so the interest on savings bank here is only 7500 so you can claim that 7500 as a deduction under 80 tta that is interest on savings bank interest up to maximum 10,000 is allowed as deduction. Here, the actual interest is only 7,500. So, you can claim that same 7,500 itself as a deduction. I hope that too is clear for you. Now, he also paid life insurance premium for 15,000 for self uh, and 10,000 for spouse and 25,000 for a dependent mother aged 71 years. So LIC premium paid is definitely deductible under ATC, but you have paid for yourself and for spouse and for your children. These three are covered under ATC. That simply means say I'm paying life insurance premium for me, for my wife and for my children that premium payable is definitely allowable as a deduction under ATC. But if I'm making premium or if I'm paying premium for my parents, whether dependent or independent, I cannot claim that amount as a deduction under ATC. So in this question, Mr. Rajesh is paying premium for his father or mother, who it is, it is for dependent mother and that 25,000 is never allowed as deduction. Because ATC, there is a definition for family, it says for assessee, 
for your spouse and for your children. For parents, you cannot claim it as a deduction under ATC. For your brother, for your sister, you cannot claim deduction under ATC. So what we can do? Premium paid 15,000 for self and 10,000 for spouse. So that 15 plus 10, 25,000 you can claim it as a deduction. So under section ATC, premium paid for self and spouse allowed as deduction. The total amount would be 25,000 rupees. 10,000 plus 15,000 it would be 25,000 rupees. Now what else we have? We have nothing more. Compute the total income of Mr. Rajesh. Now let's compute his total income. First let me compute the gross total income. Gross total income. So tell me friends what is his gross total income? 4,75,000 plus 10,500 plus 7,500 it will be gross total income will be 4,93,000. 4,93,000 would be his gross total income. From that, you can deduct 25,000 minus 7,500 and it would be 4,60,500 as his final taxable total income. That will be his taxable total income and that is the final answer of this question. I hope this question too is super clear for you. All right, friends. Now it's time for us to discuss question number five. Alright, so the question number 5 talks about Mr. Hari, aged 57 years, is a resident of India and he provides you the following details of his income pertaining to the financial year 21-22. So the question says Mr. Hari is a resident of India. So he is an Indian resident and you are supposed to answer whether the incomes, uh, he provides you the following income. Alright, so there is an interest on non-resident external account maintained with the State Bank of India as per RBI stipulations. 355,000. Then there is an interest on savings bank account with State Bank of India 8,000. Then there is an interest on fixed deposit with Punjab National Bank that is 40,000. He seeks your advice on his liability to file return of income as per income tax act for the assessment year 22-23. So and what will be your answer if he has incurred 4 lakhs on travel expense of his newly married son and daughter-in-law honeymoon in Canada. Super. So the question basically asks you to check whether Mr. Hari is required to file his return in India or not for the finance for assessment year 22-23. So let's compute for assessment year 22-23 Mr. Hari is required to file his return of income. The answer is yes or no. That's what you need to find out. So Mr. Hari being an individual normally under section 139 subsection 1 an individual is supposed to file his return of income if his total income exceeds basic exemption limit. Alright, this is what the act says. So, an individual's total income exceeds his basic exemption limit, he is supposed to file his return. He is being a resident and his age is 57 years, his basic exemption limit will be 2,50,000. So, we need to check whether the total income is above 2,50,000 or not. Now, for this, under 139 subsection 1, total income means from the normal total income, from the normal total income, you need to add back chapter 6A deductions and you need to add back section 54, 54B, 54EC, 54F, etc. exemptions. So, from the normal total income, to compute whether a total income under 139 subsection 1 was what you need to do is from your normal total income add back chapter 6 a deductions and exemptions under 54, 54b, 54 easy, 54 f etc etc. So that's what 139 subsection 1 states about. Now let's find out whether this SSA is required to file his return or not. Super. So friends let's read that question again. What are his incomes? interest income on non-resident external account. So we'll deal with the first item that is interest income on interest income from non-resident external account maintained with Reserve Bank of India. So friends listen under section 10 subsection 4 close 2 
interest on non resident external account is fully exempted no assessee as per income tax act is supposed to pay interest on non resident external account so friends normally there are two accounts non resident ordinary account and non resident external account so under section 10 subsection 4 clause 2 this interest income on non resident external account is fully exempted and the 355000 in india there is no taxability at all so the first income 355000 will be fully exempted under section 10 subsection 4 close to i hope that is clear for you now second item is interest on savings bank account maintained with state bank of india 8000 so we'll write interest on savings bank account and what how much is the interest amount it is 8000 rupees that is fully taxable in india and assessee can claim a deduction under 80 TTA up to 8000 rupees under chapter 6a 80 TTA as I say can claim a deduction up to 8000 rupees up to 10,000 rupees is the deduction but since the actual interest is less than 10,000 your deduction under 80 TTA also will be 8000 all right now interest on fixed deposit with Punjab National Bank it says 40,000 rupees so interest on fixed deposit it is 40,000 rupees if the assessee is a resident senior citizen then he would have claimed a deduction under 80 TTB here the assessee his age is 57 and he is a resident as well but he cannot claim the benefit of 80 TTB so friends what is his total income his total income in India his gross total income in India is only 48,000 rupees yes or no his gross total income is only 48,000 by claiming 80 TTA deduction, his total income would be only 40,000 rupees. That is his total income. So there is no further information. So his total income is 40,000. For the purpose of determining whether he is supposed to file his return, you have to consider this 48,000. Because I've told you, you must consider total income, whether it exceeds basic exemption limit or not. For that total income means you take your normal total income, add back chapter 6a deductions, then add back 54, 54b, 54 easy, etc. etc. That's what the act says. Now, since the total income is 48,000 before, so for the purpose of 130 and subsection 1, we will compute in a systematic manner. Say the total income is 40,000. We are adding back chapter 6a deduction. How much is chapter 6a deduction? 8,000. So the purpose of 139 subsection 1, you must consider this 48,000 as the amount, as the total income and it is less than 250,000. It is very way less than your basic exemption limit. So we can say SSE is not required to file a return. So here, Mr. What is his name? Uh, this is Mr. Hari, right? So Mr. Hari is not required to file as a return. R O I that is the first part of the answer now again part B what will be your answer if he has incurred 4 lakh on travel expenses of newly married son and daughter-in-law's honeymoon in Canada so friends they are they are asking a sub question also so under section 139 subsection 1 there is an explanation under 139 subsection 1 there is an explanation that is if you are an individual and your total income is less than basic exemption limit but you have incurred you have incurred traveling expense you have incurred traveling expenses for foreign tour for foreign tour which is more than 2 lakh rupees which is more than 2 lakh rupees which is more than 2 lakh rupees for yourself or for your relatives or for you or for others. Say for example, my total income is less than basic exemption limit, but I have incurred more than 2 lakh rupees for foreign travel in the relevant previous year. In that situation, 139 subsection 1 clearly states that SSC must file his return. If your total income is less than basic exemption limit, normally you don't need to file your return. But in the same year, if you have incurred a foreign travel expenses either for you or for someone else, which is more than 2 lakh, then you must submit your return and you must explain. See, you think like this. I'm saying my total income is less than basic exemption. 
but I've incurred more than 2 lakhs for 4 in 2. So that seems to be something illogical, right? So department wants to know what is that illogical element. You do one thing as a C, you come, file your return and explain why your total income is less than 250 and you have expended more than 2 lakh for your 4 in 2. You just file a return, that's it. All right. So in this situation, SSE has incurred a foreign tour expenses that is 4 lakh for the travel of his married son and daughter-in-law. That is just like their honeymoon trip. He has contributed 4 lakh. In that situation, Mr. Hari mandatorily required to file his return. Mandatorily required to file a return of income irrespective of irrespective of his what irrespective of his total income that's what the act says so in that scenario he must file his return of income irrespective of his total income and that is what is the final answer for this question i hope this question is super clear for you all right friends so let's understand question number six so what is question number six Income deemed to accrue or arise in India to a non-resident by way of interest, royalty or fees for technical service is to be taxed in India irrespective of territorial nexus. Examine the correctness or otherwise of the given statement. So you are supposed to say uh, this uh, statement is whether true or false. So hope you remember, hope you remember under section 9 under section 9 the act says if a non resident if a non resident receives interest interest on loan or, or he receives royalty or he receives fees for technical service technical service from either a resident in India, resident in India, or from government of India, or from a non-resident in India, then such royalty or fees for a technical service or interest shall be deemed to be, it shall be deemed to be accrued or rise in India, accrued or arised in India, according to section 9. Hope you remember this section. Now friends, under section 9, it also states that if the resident in India is utilizing the loan or the royalty service or the fees for a technical service for a business or a profession or for making any source of income outside India, if that particular non if that particular resident who pays the interest on loan or royalty or fees for technical services is utilizing the loan amount or that particular royalty service or that particular technical service in a business or a profession or any to earn any income outside india then this deeming fiction shall not be applicable for government of india whether it is utilized in india or not deeming fiction will come into picture and for a non resident this section 9 will be applicable only if he utilizes that loan or he utilizes that royalty service or technical service in a business or a profession in India. In India. Hope you remember this. So we can say for a non-resident, now this is the preset. This is uncovered under section 9, the deeming fiction. Now on the light of this, let's read that question again. Income deemed to income deemed to accrue or arise in India to a non-resident by way of interest, royalty and fees for technical services is to be taxed in India irrespective of territorial nexus. Say, I will say this statement is correct. This statement is correct because interest if payable by a resident in India, interest is payable by a resident in India or government of India or a non-resident for utilizing or for non-resident if he utilizes that particular loan amount in India for making any income from a business or profession in India, in all these three cases, irrespective of territorial nexus, that interest, royalty or fees for technical services will be taxable in the hands of a non-resident according to section 9. 
So I will say this statement is right. I hope you got the answer. All right. So the income by way of fees for technical services, interest or royalty from services utilized in India would be deemed to be accrue or rise in India in the case of non-resident and will be included in computing his total income in India. So we can say irrespective of territorial nexus, according to section 9, this deeming fiction will come into picture. If you write this much, you will get three marks for this question. All right, friends. So time for us to solve question number seven, that is. During the previous year 21-22, the following transactions took place in the in respect of Mr. Raghav who is 56 years old. So there are certain information Mr. Raghav has two house properties in Mumbai, then he had a house in Delhi, then Raghav receives the following income, interest on debages, salary etc. Then Mr. and Mrs. Raghav forms a partnership firm with equal share and etc etc information is there. So what is the final requirement of this question friends? Compute the total income of Mr. Raka for assessment year 22, 23 and it carries 8 marks. So you are supposed to compute his total income of Mr. Raka for assessment year 20 to 23 and it has 8 marks. So while reading the question itself, let's start solving the answer friends. So yes, computation, computation of total income, of total income of Mr. Raghav, of Mr. Raghav for the financial year 2021-22. So let's compute his total income by reading each and every adjustment. It carries eight marks. It's a very important question, eight mark question it is. So we'll read the question again. So his age is 56 years old, all right? So we'll read the first adjustment. Mr. Raghav owns two house properties in Mumbai. The details in respect of these house properties are under. House property 1 is self-occupied and house property 2 is let out. So he has two house properties. So we will write income from house property. All right. So first we will consider let out property income from let out property. All right, so we will consider income from let out property first. So house property uh, two is the let out property. So rent received per month is 60,000 per month. Municipal taxes paid, he didn't pay any municipal taxes. Interest on loan for the purchase of property 5 lakh. Principal repayment of loan from HDFC, there is 3 lakh. All right, so we can take actual rent received. Actual rent received for this particular house is 60,000 per month. Yes or no? So 60,000 per month. So 60,000 into 12 months, the total amount would be 60,000 into 12. It will be 7,20,000 will be the actual rent received. Since there is no fair rent municipal value standard rent, we are considering this actual rent received itself as the gross annual value. So normally how we will compute gross annual value, we take the fair end of a house and compare it with the municipal value and whichever is higher shall be selected and you compare this higher with the standard rent and whichever is lower shall be selected, this lower shall be called as expected rent. Then you compare this expected rent with the actual rent and whichever higher shall be the gross annual value. However, if the actual rent is less compared to the expected rent due to vacancy, then you can consider actual rent itself as the gross annual value. This is how you normally compute gross annual value. But here, we don't know what is the fair rent, we don't know what is the municipal value, we don't know what is the standard rent. So we are taking the actual rent itself as the gross annual value. Now, we can deduct municipal taxes. Municipal taxes from this, since there is no municipal tax, you know, the question itself is says, municipal tax paid is nil. So we don't have any municipal taxes here. So the net annual value would be the same 7,20,000. From that you can deduct what? Standard deduction. Standard deduction at 30% you can deduct. So 7,20,000 into 30% it would be 2,16,000 rupees will be the standard deduction. Now again from this you can deduct what? Interest on loan taken for the purchase of property. So interest on loan taken for the purchase of property. If it is a let out property there is no ceiling limit. All right. But if it is a self-occupied property for the purchase of property, if the construction for the purchase or construction of the property, if the loan is taken on or after 1st April 1999, then 
you can take an interest up to 2 lakh as a deduction. That is only for self-occupied property. But for let-out property, there is no ceiling limit. You can take the absolute actual interest as a deduction without any limit. So we will take the entire 5 lakh as a deduction under section 24B that is interest on loan. Interest on loan for the purchase of house property. We will take the entire 5 lakh as a deduction from here. All right. So after deducting these two, what will be the net annual value? Sorry, what will be the taxable income from that house property? It would be 4,000 rupees will be the taxable income from the let out house property. So this will be the taxable income from the let out house property. Now we will deal with the self-occupied property right now. So self-occupied property. Self-occupied property as you know the net annual value will be always what nil. The net annual value will be always nil for a self-occupied property. So what we can do, we can consider the rent received won't be there because it is self-occupied. Municipal taxes paid, we cannot claim it as a deduction because the net annual value shall be always nil. Now interest on loan taken for the purchase of house property, you can claim it as a deduction. But only up to 2 lakh rupees is the maximum deduction for interest paid. Yes or no? So he can take only up to 2 lakh rupees as a deduction for that. So interest on loan for self-occupied property maximum deduction shall be what 2 lakh rupees not more than that so ultimately there will be a net loss net loss from that particular self-occupied property that will be 2 lakh rupees will be the loss from self-occupied property now so is there anything else in relation to house property? There is a principal repayment of loan which is taken from HDFC that is 2 lakh for the self-occupied and 3 lakh for the let out property. So for the principal repayment as you know you can claim a chapter 6a deduction under section 80c so we will write that too. So under this I will write chapter 6a chapter 6a deductions under section 80c housing loan principal repayment housing loan principal repayment principal repayment is allowed as a deduction and what is the actual housing loan principal repayment here friends from house property which is self-occupied it is 2 lakh from the self-occupied property principal repayment is 2 lakh from the let out property principal repayment is 3 lakh yes or no but maximum deduction under ATC shall be 1,50,000. Whatever be your actual principal repayment, maximum deduction under ATC because under ATC there is an overall ceiling limit and it shall be maximum 1,50,000. Alright, so that's it. Now, let's continue reading this question. That is the end of first adjustment. Now, moving forward with the adjustment number 2. Mr. Rakav had a house in Delhi. Okay, so he had a house in Delhi during financial year 12-13. He had transferred the house to Miss Vamika, daughter of his sister, without any consideration. So, we will write a separate note for that. So, Mr. R, Mr. Rakav has a house property in Delhi. So, he had a house property in Delhi, which he transferred it to Vamika. Vamika, who is Vamika? Uh, Vamika is the daughter of his sister. So, it is daughter of his sister and this has been transferred without consideration this has been transferred without consideration now friends if there is a transfer of asset without transfer without consideration all right if there is a transfer of asset without consideration then what is the impact friends so if you are transferring a particular asset without consideration then income from that asset have to be clubbed in the hands of transferer however there is a exception to that point under clubbing provision there is an exception what was the exception you are transferring an asset to some other person's name and that asset that transfer is irrevocable during the lifetime of that transferee then clubbing provisions is not attracted Say for example, I'll tell you one example. Say I am transferring my income generating asset to you without consideration. Then normally speaking, the income which is received by you on that asset which I've transferred to you without consideration shall be clubbed in my hands. That is the normal scenario. 
but section 64 itself is saying section 64 62 itself is saying when i'm transferring an asset to you which is an irrevocable transfer during your lifetime that means i'm giving my asset to you without any consideration and i'm saying to you you use the income you use the asset you enjoy the income from this asset till you leave once you die i will take back this asset all right so in that scenario clubbing provisions are not retracted that simply means the income received by you can be will be taxable in your own hands it will not be clubbed back in my hands but there is a condition for that what is the condition if i am transferring an asset to you and i am not taking that asset back during your lifetime then at the time of transfer or afterwards i am not supposed to enjoy any part of income transferred to you or any part of income from the asset transfer to you that simply means rakov when he transfers an asset or house property to vamika and he says he says in the question it is very clear he would go uh, he would go back to mr the house would go back to mr rakov after the lifetime of mr Va miss vamika so that house has been given to vamika and she can use the house till he leaves once she dies Rakha will take back that particular house. That's what the question says. The transfer was made with a condition that 10% of rental income from such house will be paid to Mr. Rakhav. So, if that clubbing provision, normally when this asset is transferred to Vamika and she can enjoy this asset till, he, till she leaves. Alright? In that scenario, normally clubbing provisions are not attracted. But there should be a condition. What was the condition? that as the transfer that means rakhav after the transfer should not directly or indirectly enjoy any part of transferred assets income but here there is a condition that vamika should pay 10 percentage of income from that transferred house property to rakhav Hence, definitely all the income received by Vamika from that house property will be clubbed in the hands of Rakhav. Because section 62 is very clear. If you want to get out of clubbing provision, one thing you can do, you can transfer an asset to some other person without consideration. And you are not taking that asset back during the lifetime of transferring. Subject to a condition that the transferer must not enjoy directly or indirectly any income from the transferred asset during the lifetime of transferring. But here, at the time of transfer itself, there is a condition reserved. What is that condition? 10% of income from that particular house property which is received by Vamika will be enjoyed by Mr. Rakhav. So, in that scenario, definitely clubbing provisions will come into picture. I hope you got my point. So, definitely clubbing is required to be done. So, you tell me what is the rent received by Vamika during the previous year, 21-22 from such house property is 5,50,000. So definitely that 5,50,000 is required to be clubbed. Not 10% of 5,50. The entire 5,50,000 rupees is required to be clubbed in the hands of Mr. Rakhav because he has put a condition to enjoy some income of that transferred asset. So definitely complete income will be clubbed in the hands of Mr. Rakhav. So clubbing of income from house property transferred to vamika all right so under this we can write <coughs> mr rakhav has transferred an asset without consideration without consideration without consideration to Vamika without consideration to Vamika under section 62 under section 62 all income received by Vamika from such asset will be clubbed in the hands of in the hands of Rakhav since he enjoys 10% of income received from 
such house property even after transfer even after transfer so that the entire income of 5 lakh 50 thousand will be clubbed in the hands of mr rakam from that he can claim what he can claim standard deduction at 30 percentage so 5 lakh 50 thousand into 30 percentage standard deduction would be 1 lakh 65 thousand rupees will be the standard deduction because it is a house property he can enjoy standard deduction as well so what will be the net income from that particular property so the net income from that particular property would be 3 lakh 85 thousand rupees i hope that too is absolutely clear for you all right now we will mark that too so we have three incomes from house property number one it is a let out property number two it is actually a loss from self-occupied property and number three there is a uh, income from uh, what transferred house property also now we will continue reading that particular question friends listen mr raghav receives following income from messrs m private limited during previous year 21 22 all right so he receives interest on debentures of 7 lakh 50 thousand and he receives 3 lakh 75 thousand he does not possess adequate professional qualification commensurate with the salary received by him and the shareholding of messrs private limited on 31st march 2022 is also given so we will write that too so under ifos we can consider under ifos we can write he receives interest on debentures so interest on debentures interest on debentures how much is the interest on debentures friends it is 7 lakh 50 thousand rupees is the interest on debentures received by him now he also receives what salary 3 lakh 75 thousand so friends for that we will write we will draw a flow chart all right so he receives salary from which company the company's name is uh, messrs m private limited so there was a company called messrs m private limited from this company mr rakav is receiving some salary some salary and how much is the salary it is three lakh seventy five thousand rupees is the salary and the shareholding of this particular company is also given and he does not have any professional qualification to receive the salary that is also given in the question so mr salary sorry mr rakav does not own any professional qualification to receive this much of salary that's what the question says now let's understand what exactly is the uh, shareholding pattern of that particular company mr rakav does not have any equity shares over there does not have any equity shares does not have any preference shares as well mrs rakav his wife has two percentage equity shares and 25 percentage preference shares mr j krishnan that means brother of mrs rakav has 98 percentage equity shares and 75 percentage preference shares in that particular company super so listen friends mrs rakav mrs rakav has two percentage equity shares equity shares in that particular company and brother of mrs rakav has 98 percentage equity shares in that particular company from this company mr rakav is receiving what mr rakav is receiving salary of 3 lakh 75 thousand rupees without adequate professional qualification without professional qualification this is what the question says now friends hope you remember under clubbing provision if a particular person receives remuneration without adequate qualification from a concern where his spouse has what substantial interest either spouse or their relatives together has substantial interest from that concern say for example friends forget all say for example say i'm working in a company called abc limited all right my wife has substantial interest in that particular concern and i am receiving salary from that particular concern without any adequate qualification then what will happen that salary will be clubbed with my wife that salary will be clubbed in the hands of wife that will be treated as an income of my wife this is what clubbing provision states about now in this question wife alone does not have substantial interest because substantial interest says at least 20 percentage of voting power in a concern the one person should have at least 20 percentage voting power to be uh, what to be treated as substantial interest in a particular concern but friends 
here mrs rakhav does not have substantial interest in that particular firm but 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 mrs rakhav towards his brother by considering mrs rakhav and her brother both together have 100 percent equity shares in Messrs Private Limited. In that scenario, definitely this particular 3,75,000 rupees salary received by Mr. Raghav will be clubbed in the hands of Mrs. Raghav. Got my point? Mrs. Raghav alone does not have any substantial interest. But according to section 62, clubbing, sorry, section 64, clubbing provision, what they are saying, if a person along with his, what, if the spouse along with her, relative holds substantial interest in a concern and his or her husband receives what receives salary from that particular concern without adequate consideration or sorry without adequate qualification then that particular salary have to be clubbed in the hands of what mrs rakov here so this 375000 rupees is not taxable in the hands of mr rakov it have to be included in the total income of mrs rakov i hope you got my point because mrs rakov along with her brother holds shares carrying 100 percentage voting power in messrs private limited and they have substantial interest in that particular company and that's why mr rakov even though he receives salary without adequate professional uh, professional qualification that have to be clubbed in the hands of mrs rakov so we will write this note you don't have to consider this point into the computation. You have to write a note below. What is the note? Mrs. Rakhav along with her brother has substantial interest. Substantial interest in that particular concern. In the Messrs M Private Limited. You can write 100 percentage equity shares in this case. And Mr. Rakhav receives salary 3,75,000 without professional qualification. Hence, that 3,75,000 have to be clubbed with total income of Mrs. Rakhav. So, it is not taxable in the hands of Mr. Rakhav. So, this 3,75,000 salary is not taxable in the hands of Mr. Rakhav. This interest on debages will be definitely taxable in the hands of Rakhav. But 3,75,000 salary is not taxable in the hands of Rakhav. It will be taxable in the hands of Mrs. Rakhav. I hope you got my point. Now, moving forward with the next adjustment, that is adjustment number four. It says, Mr. and Mrs. Rakhav forms a partnership firm with equal share in profits. Mr. Rakhav has transferred a fixed deposit of one crore to such firm. The firm had no income or expense other than interest of 9 lakh receipt from such fixed deposit. The firm distributed entire surplus to Mr. and Mrs. Rakhav at the end of year. All right, friends. So, this is in relation to what? Some interest income from a partnership firm. So, we will write a separate flow chart for this also for a better understanding. So, I will read that adjustment again. So, what they are saying? Mr. and Mrs. Rakhav forms a partnership firm. So, Mr. Rakhav and Mrs. Rakhav, they formed a partnership firm. All right, they formed a partnership firm. Now, what they are saying, with equal shares, um, with equal profit sharing ratio, he has 50% and she also has 50%, 50-50 PSR, profit sharing ratio. And Mr. Rakhav transferred fixed deposit of 1 crore to such firm. So, Mr. Rakhav, what he did, he transferred fixed deposit of rupees 1 crore to this partnership firm. So, he transferred 1 crore worth fixed deposit to this partnership firm. And firm had no income or expense other than the interest of rupees 9 lakh. From this FD, the firm received an interest of 9 lakh rupees. 9 lakh rupees interest received. Alright. Apart from this interest, there were no other income for the partnership firm. Superb. Now, 
The firm had no other expenses other than the interest received from first such fixed deposit. The firm distributed the entire surplus to Mr. and Mrs. Rakav at the end of year. So the firm distributed the entire surplus. That means the firm might have distributed 4.50 lakhs to Rakav and 4.50 lakhs to what? Mrs. Rakav. So first of all friends, when the partnership firm receives 9 lakh rupees, when a partnership firm receives 9 lakh rupees uh, as interest, it will be assessed. It will be assessed as taxable income of the partnership firm and the firm is supposed to pay taxes on that. Pay taxes on that. Alright. Now friends, we don't know Rakhav uh, transferred this fixed asset for a consideration or not. That is actually not clear in the question. But Rakhav has transferred a fixed deposit of 1 crore in the hands of partnership firm. And the partnership firm when they receive interest, that will be accessible in the hands of partnership firm. Alright. Now, this 4.50 is, you can call it as share of profit. Share of profit from the partnership firm. Because partnership firm does not have any other income or losses. This entire 9 lakh will be the profit of partnership firm. That interest of 9 lakh will be the profit of partnership firm. That partnership firm when they pay 4.5 to Mr. R and 4.5 to Mrs. R, this 4.5 will be fully exempted under 10 to A in the hands of Mr. and Mrs. R. Alright. So this income will be fully exempted under section 10 to A. Why? Because the partnership firm themselves had paid taxes at 30%. There is no requirement of any clubbing or there is no requirement of any further taxation. This 4.5 lakhs received by Mr. Rakhav and Mrs. Rakhav will be fully exempted under 10 to A. Then don't even think about clubbing here. Got my point? Because the partnership firm at the time of receipt of this 9 lakh, they are supposed to pay taxes at what rate? At 30 percentage rate according to their slab rate. That is 30 percentage on their total income. After paying taxes when they distribute this particular income, we don't know. Uh, how much they have distributed but when they distributes the income to Mr. and Mrs. Rakhav ultimately they are afterwards they are not supposed to pay any taxes this will be fully exempted under 10 to A. Alright so what you can do you can write a note for that. So interest income received from partnership firm again you can write a footnote for that interest income received from partnership firm is fully exempted is fully exempted exempted in hands of in hands of mr and mrs rakhav under section 10 to a since that interest is share of profits share of profits of partnership firm. So it is fully exempted in the hands of Mr. and Mrs. Raghav. Hence no further adjustment required in this question. I hope that is clear for you. Now moving on to the fifth adjustment that is Mr. Raghav holds preference shares in Messrs. K Private Limited and he instructed the company to pay dividend to Miss Gidanjali, daughter of his servant. The transfer is irrevocable for the lifetime of Gidan. This is Geetanchi, not Geetanchi, I'm sorry. This is Geetanchi, whatever. Okay. So, Mrs. G. Alright, Miss G. And the dividend received by Miss G during the previous year 21-22 is 13 lakh. So, friends, let's understand or let's consider this also by drawing a flowchart. So, Mr. Rakhav, what he did, he transferred some preference shares. He had some preference shares in Messrs. K Private Limited. So, Messrs. K private limited he had some preference shares preference shares all right and this preference shares uh, he instructed the company to pay dividend to miss Gitanshi. so he told this company to pay dividend so the dividend will be paid to miss g Gitanshi. she is the daughter of rakhav's servant right daughter of his servant and the transfer is irrevocable for the lifetime of Gitanshi. So, this transfer means this dividend income can be enjoyed by Miss Gitanshi till she leaves. That's what they are saying. This dividend income is, this transfer is irrevocable for the lifetime of Gitanshi. 
and the dividend received by Gidanshi during 21-22 was 13 lakh. She received 13 lakh as dividend income in the year 21-22 as well. So what should be the treatment? Listen friends, two things you should know. This is a pure case of transfer of income. Transfer of income without transfer of asset. Without transfer of asset. Yes or no? This is a case of transfer of income without transfer of asset. If income alone is transferred, if income alone is transferred without transferring the asset, then whether that income transfer is irrevocable or irrevocable, it will be always clubbed in the hands of Mr. Rakhav. That means the original transferer. Now friends, instead of transferring dividend, if Mr. Rakhav had transferred preference shares to the Gitanshi, that means the daughter of his servant, then and if that transfer is irrevocable during the lifetime of Gitanshi and Mr. Rakhav, after transferring, if he is not enjoying any part of dividend income, in that scenario, clubbing is not required to be done because it's, it is covered as an exception. All right. But in this situation, definitely this income of 13 lakhs is required to be clubbed in the hands of Mr. Rakhav since, since it is a transfer of income without transfer of asset. So what we can do, this entire 13 lakh is taxable under IFOS under section 56. So you can write it under IFOS. So interest on preference dividend. What is the, it's not interest on preference dividend. I'm really sorry friends. That is dividend on preference shares. Dividend on preference shares is clubbed in the hands of Rakov. Clubbed in the hands of Mr. R since it is transfer of income without transfer of asset. All right. So yeah, how much is the amount? It is 13 lakh rupees. Yes. Super. Now, moving forward with the sixth adjustment, I think that is the last adjustment, right? Other income of Mr. Rakhav includes interest from savings bank account 2 lakh. So, we can straight away write that. So, interest on savings bank account that is 2 lakh. At the same time, we can claim ATTTA deduction as well. So, under section ATTTA, up to 10,000 rupees, he can claim as a deduction as a chapter 6A item. Now, he received a cash gift of 75,000 from daughter of his sister on his birthday. Now, let's check whether daughter of his sister is his relative or not. All right. So, friends, listen. Under section 56, subsection 2, close 10, if a person receives any gift from a relative, then it is not accessible as a gift under IFOS. Now, the question is who is gift? Sorry, who is a relative? Spouse of individual. If I am the individual who receives the gift, I am receiving the gift from my wife, from my spouse. Spouse is not a, a what? Spouse is actually a relative, so that is not taxable. So let's understand who exactly is the relative. All right. So relative definition says. So I will write it here. Spouse of individual is definitely a relative. Number two, brother or sister of individual brother of sister of individual my brother and my sister then brother or sister of spouse that means my wife's brother or sister then brother or sister of parents brother or sister of my parents both maternal and paternal you can consider then any lineal ascendant or descendant ascendant or descendant Linear ascendant or descendant means my father, grandfather, both paternal and maternal. Then my son, grandson, all right, and my daughter, granddaughter, or son, granddaughter, whatever it is. So my linear ascendant and descendants are also my relatives. Then lineal ascendant or descendant of spouse, lineal ascendant or descendant of my spouse is also my relative my wife's father grandfather my wife's son will be my son too even if it is not say for example i had a second marriage and my wife has already a children that is also covered under spouse definition then the final says spouse of any of those persons mentioned from 
here to here. That means my brother is a relative. Brother's spouse is also a relative. My sister is my relative. Sister's spouse is also my relative. Likewise, spouse of any of those persons covered above is also what a relative. Now, here in this question, it says, in this question, it says, cash gift is received from daughter of his sister. His sister is Rakab's relative, but daughter of his sister is not Rakab's relative. So, according to section 56, subsection 2, close 10, daughter of your sister is not your relative or son of your sister is not your relative. And hence, the 75,000 is definitely have to be treated as an accessible income under 56, subsection 2, close 10. So, under section 56, subsection 2, close 10, that 75,000 is fully taxable because daughter of your sister is not your relative. Super. Now, uh, is there anything more? No, there is nothing more. Now, let's compute the total income, friends. So, first of all, we will take the total income from house property. So, how much is the total income from house property? We have an income of 4,000. Then we have a loss of 2 lakh. So, minus 2 lakh. Plus, you have an income of 3 lakh 80, 85,000. So, 3 lakh 85,000. That will give you 1 lakh 89,000 as the net income from house property. This is the net income income from house property 189 now you have ifos income so what is the total ifos income friends so let's consider the total ifos income 7 lakh 50 thousand plus 13 lakh plus 2 lakh plus 75 thousand it will give you 23 lakh 25 thousand rupees as the income from house property so 23 25 23 lakh 25 thousand will be the income from house property so now let's compute the gross total income gross total income so gross total income would be 25 lakh 14 thousand rupees by adding everything 25 lakh 14 thousand rupees will be the gross total income from that you can deduct these two chapter 6a deductions so that your total income would be so 1 lakh 50 thousand as ATC so 1 lakh 50 thousand under ATC and 10 thousand under ATTTA so your total income would be 2 lakh Sorry, 23 lakh, 23 lakh, 54,000 rupees will be your taxable total income. I think that is the final requirement of this question. Yes. Compute the total income for Mr. Raka for assessment year 22, 23 will be how much? It will be 23 lakh, 54,000. I hope it is super clear for you. All right. 23 lakh, 54,000 rupees is the total income taxable. And it carries how much marks, friends? It carries eight marks. I hope it is clear for you. All right, friends, so moving on to solve the last question of this question paper that is January 2021 question paper. It is question number eight. So discuss the taxability of the following transactions, giving reasons in the light of relevant provisions for your conclusion. So you need to attempt any two out of the following three, but we are attempting three out of three. All right. So you need to attempt only two out of three. You need to say, discuss the taxability. You must comment upon the taxability of the following provision in the light of relevant provisions of income tax. Super. So we will discuss on the first one. Rajpal took a land on rent from Shilpa on monthly rent of 10,000. So while reading the question itself, we will draw a flowchart for better understanding. So Mr. Rajpal, so Mr. R took a land on lease. Land on lease from whom from uh, shilpa on a monthly rent of 10000 it the owner of land was shilpa all right and the monthly rent which he is agreed to pay is 10000 per month and this land is used for what purpose land on rent we are not sure he sublets the land to mr manish for a monthly rent of 11500 so thereafter he sublets Sublets means I've taken a land for lease. Then I'm allowing somebody else to take that land on lease. And so to Mr. Manish. So Mr. Manish, I'm subletting it and I'm receiving 11,500 from Mr. Manish. Super. Now, Manish uses the land for gazing of cattle required for agricultural activity. So, Manish used for that particular land for agricultural activities. That is gazing of cattle. He used that particular land for agricultural activities. Now, Mr. Rajpal wants to claim a deduction of 10,000 being rent paid by him 
to Shilpa from the rental income received by it from Mr. Manish. That simply means Rajpal has an income of 11,500. He wants to claim this 10,000 paid to the original owner as a deduction from his taxable income. You are supposed to comment upon the contention of Mr. Rajpal. First of all, let me tell you this agriculture land which is taken on lease. This land was taken by Mr. Rajpal on lease and it has been rented out, subletted to Mr. Manish and it has been used for agricultural purposes. All right. Whether it is direct lease income or whether it is income from subletting of an agricultural land, that income will be treated as an agricultural income only. So this entire income that is lease income from agriculture land will be treated as what? Agri income and it will be fully exempted under 10 subsection 1. So both the lease received by Shilpa, the original owner of agriculture land and Mr. Uh, Rajpal, that means the uh, lease owner, the first lease owner of that particular land, this entire income will be treated as what? Agricultural income and it will be fully exempted. In the case of an exempted income, Mr. Rajpal wants to claim this 10,000 as a deduction. So that contention itself is an absolute what? Absolute stupidity because that entire 11,400 received by Mr. Rajpal is fully exempted because if you are receiving some rent from what? An agricultural land, then that particular rent is fully exempted under 10 subsection 1. So from exempted income, nobody is supposed to claim any expenses according to section 14a. So what we can say here, since that entire 11,500 is an exempted income, Rajpal cannot claim this 10,000 per month as a deduction on account of section 14a of income tax. What is section 14a? You cannot claim any expense in relation to an exempted income while computing the tax provision. That's what 14a is all about. So ultimately here, this entire 11,500 is fully exempted in the hands of Mr. Rajpal and he cannot claim that 10,000 per month paid to the original owner as a deduction. Since the income itself is exempted, then why should you claim deduction, man? That's what 14A is all about. I hope it is clear for you. Super. Now situation 2. Mr. Uh, Pratham, Mr. Pratham or whatever it is, Mr. P. Alright. Mr. P, a non-resident in India, received a sum of 1,14,000 from Mr. Rakesh. So we will do one thing. We will draw a flowchart. So Mr. Pratham, I'll call us Mr. P. Mr. P is basically whom? He is basically a non-resident in India. So no. He is basically a non-resident in India. So he is a NR in India. He is a NR in India. And he receives what? He receives some royalty. He receives 1,14,000 from Rakesh, a resident and ordinary resident in India. Not royalty. He received 1,14,000 from Mr. Rakesh, an ROR in India. So Rakesh was an ROR. The question is not saying it is royalty. Okay. Yeah, so he receives 1,14,000 rupees. For what purpose? We don't know the purpose for the time being. And the amount was paid to Pratham on account of transfer of right to use manufacturing processes developed by Pratham. And this transfer was for Prat Pr Mr. P has developed something. And he transferred that right to use. Right to use his development to Mr. Rakesh. For that, Mr. Rakesh is paying 1,14,000. Yes or no? That's what the question says. Now, friends, listen. Let's read that sentence again for a better clarity. It says the amount was paid to Pratham on account of transfer of right use manufacturing process developed by Mr. Pratham. So, Mr. Pratham has developed some manufacturing process and that right to use that manufacturing process has been transferred to uh, whom? Transferred to Rakesh. For that, Rakesh is paying uh, an amount of 1,14,000. Now this is called as a royalty. Royalty means what? Payment for right to use something. It is said to be what? Royalty. Alright. So here this 1,40,000 is in nature of what? Royalty. Because a payment for right to use something shall always be called as royalty according to section 9. So this 1,14,000 is actually a royalty. And the manufacturing process was developed by Mr. Pratham in Singapore. And Mr. Rakesh uses the process in his business carried on him in Dubai. So Rakesh is actually a ROR, but he utilizes, he utilizes the manufacturing process in Dubai, in Dubai, for his business in Dubai. Yes or no? So he utilizing that manufacturing process in his business in Dubai. 
Now the question is, is this 114,000 taxable in the hands of Mr. P? The answer is no. Hope you remember, under section 9, subsection 1, it says very clear, if a resident is paying a royalty to a non-resident and the royalty service is utilized by the resident for his business or profession outside India or for earning some other income from a source outside India, then the deeming fiction under section 9 is not applicable. Since the payer, the person who makes the payment is Mr. Rakesh, being an ROR, makes a payment that is in nature of royalty to a non-resident and this person Rakesh is utilizing that particular service for his business in Dubai and hence this entire sum will not be deemed to be accrued or arised in the hands of Mr. P, that non-resident, section 9 will not be applicable there. So that's what they are asking. The question is to uh, whether this income is taxable in India, that's what you must say. So the final answer is this is not taxable in India. Why? Because section 9 is not applicable over there. I hope that is super clear for you. All right, friends. Now moving on to the third scenario. So let's understand the third scenario here. So what exactly is the third scenario? So listen. <clears throat> Mr. Netram grows paddy on land. So paddy on land itself is a primary activity in uh, what do you say in the land. And he, then he employs mechanical operations to grain uh, mechanical operations on the grain to make it fit for sale in the market like removing hay shaft from the grain filtering the grain and finally packing the rice in gunny bags he claims the entire income earned by him for the sale of rice is agricultural income not liable to income tax since the paddy has grown and land is not fit for sale in its original form so you must comment upon his contention so friends it's a very simple one say i have some paddy field all right and my output from the field will be paddy all right it will be paddy then i have to process this paddy to make it rice normally we go to the market and we purchase rice not paddy so his contention is paddy is not directly marketable because nobody wants to buy paddy everybody wants rice right rice we cook and we eat paddy we don't cook and we eat we have to process paddy to get rice so mr netram grows paddy and then he employs some mechanical operations on the gain on the grain to make it fit for sale in the market all right and he claims that entire activity is agricultural activity and the answer is yes his claim is right so all the activities to make your primary agricultural produce marketable will be treated as what will be treated as agricultural activity itself so all the activities employed to render your produce fit to be taken to the market would be agricultural income itself. So the process of removing what? Removing hay. So the process of removing hay, shaft from the grain, filtering the grain and finally packing the rice on gunny bags etc. is to make that rice marketable. So this entire process will be treated as agricultural process and all the income of Mr. Netram will be fully exempted under 10 subsection 1. I hope that too is super clear for you. By that we can say our entire discussion is over. I hope you like this particular question paper discussion and friends please don't forget to share this particular video with your friends and colleagues. And thank you for watching your matching my video. Stay blessed and take care. Before we conclude, let me tell you this again. So don't forget to join our telegram channel CAJK Inter DT. All right, this is exclusive for your inter syllabus and you can scan this QR code and directly join my telegram channel. So take care friends. See you. Bye bye and stay blessed.